Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pronouns of your choosing. It is that time of the week once again. Welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. We're going to jump headfirst to another amazing episode. Congratulations on making the decision to be here with us today. It was a good decision. You're not going to regret it. Without further ado, let's see who we got in the hot seat for today. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Ross Neithling. Ross's incredible story is one of a professional soldier in the military who, after leaving, retrained to become a qualified vet, and then, despite getting out alive, headed back into some of these conflict zones to become the war vet. My chat with Ross today really brings to light some of the things that's happening to the non-human casualties in these war zones and gives us some insights on how people leaving frontline work can retrain and ignite a different passion while still embracing that overwhelming desire to make a difference in the world. But before we get in there with Ross, let's hear from those incredible peeps that make up the rest of our podcast family. It's our silent soldiers, our partners of the podcast. First up, we have PBI Performance Products. PBI products are protection without compromise. Our PBI fabrics have been renowned for their unique combination of flame resistance, durability, and comfort. I have worn PBI products since starting my career 13 years now, and they are the very first choice in protection for pretty much every extreme condition from NASA astronauts to emergency responders, the military, Formula One. So it goes without saying we are a massive fan of PBI, and it's great to have them as a fan and a sponsor of the podcast. If you want to hear more about it, go over to pbiproducts.com or just check in the notes below. You will find a link to PBI. A big thanks once again to our long-term sponsor, William Wood Watches, who bring us, of course, our Chivalrous Collection, Bronze Edition, Valiant Collection, and coming to 2021 from the 1st of March is their new Triumph Collection. William Wood Watches is a UK-based watch manufacturer where upcycling is taken to a whole new level. William Wood are all about history on your wrist and feeling the beat of the fire service with you every step of the way. William Wood Watches has the vision to be the leading sustainable watch brand that upcycles rescue service materials for a new life once forgotten now reborn johnny always says the best part of the journey for him was seeing the watches on the wrists of people who appreciate the story the history the values if you want to become part of the william wood watches family head over to williamwoodwatches.com where johnny and the team have some beautiful beautiful pieces to share with us so get over have a look get yourself registered and check out some of the incredible stuff at williamwoodwatches.com now are you the sort of person that wants to be in there in the know first thing And if you want to hear about enhanced limited time offers and exclusive giveaways for emergency services workers, NHS, social care, armed forces members, then be sure to like and follow the Blue Light Guard on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter with weekly announcements and competitions with brands such as Prezzo, Starbucks, P&O Cruises, that's right, P&O Cruises, Make sure you are in with the chance of winning today. Head over to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and search for Blue Light Card. Give them a follow. Give them a like. You should be there anyway. Every day you fail to do this, you are missing out on some of the great savings from Blue Light Card, specifically put together as that massive thank you to all of our emergency services operators. Well, there you have it, boys and girls. They are the names in the frames. So without further ado, if you can barely contain your excitement any longer, then buckle up for safety, and I will see you on the other side. You got me better. I've got you, brother. Cool, man. I don't know what's going on with this camera, dude. Um, <laughs> you sound perfect, though. There he is. How you doing? <laughs> God, look at my hair. <laughs> yeah, I'm very well, man. How are you? My good lady actually mentioned your you hair good? yesterday. Uh, I was sitting uh, sitting last yeah, night. Look at it. That is awesome, man. I'm I'm envious, man. I'm going bold. <laughs> so I've just gone for the you know whatever this is like because mine's just I go tough to you, but like Einstein otherwise. But um, and I said to my wife that uh, what, that I said all the awesome stuff that uh, that you were doing. I said oh, Ross Ross is coming on tomorrow. Really really interesting guy. And she was like, Oh my god, I love his hair. And I says, Yeah, you used to have short hair. And then she was looking at some of your old stuff. <laughs> and uh, I think you got a secret admirer all of a sudden. I don't have to be careful. <laughs> How are you, my good man? Cool man. Yeah, no, I'm really well, man. Really Really well. I've just been rushing around this morning, but I'm good, man. I've done my exercise and sweet. I'm just catching up with a coffee here. I hope you don't mind. No, no, Roger that, man. I mean, I'm I'm drinking urine at the minute, yeah. so uh, we're all good. <laughs> yeah, it looks good, dude. I got some uh, electrolytes, cool. and uh, I was training with clients. I tend to start about four a.m. with clients, and um, and I finish around eight or nine, um, and then I've got my daughter. So beautiful. Any questions, right, man. queries, or concerns? All right, I'm a very best, but I can't guarantee it. I genuinely will try. Um, don't look at me like an angry headmaster if I do so. No, man, swearing is absolutely fine. Uh, nobody owns the podcast. We don't have to worry about it. Yeah, all right. I'm ready. Let's go. How am I pronouncing your last name? Neathling? Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, that's as good as it's going to get. <laughs> <laughs> that's a win, mate. I'll take that. That's probably one of the best pronunciations I've heard of it. Beautiful.
Ross Neatherling, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, brother? Yeah, thanks very much, mate. I'm very well. How are you? I'm awesome, my man. I uh, came across your account. I'm constantly trawling to uh, identify these awesome savages from across all the emergency services. And <laughs> it, it came to my mind that we've had some awesome police and military people in, in the background, but we hadn't had ever had a vet. And there was something so unique about your story in that it's kind of that unique blend. So what came first for you? Because you're a, you're a military vet or you're a vet that works in the military? Um, neither really, um, professionally what came first was my, my time in the military. And then I, it just happened that it worked out time-wise immediately thereafter, like we're talking days after I was officially discharged after my voluntary service, I, um, entered vet school, you know, the privately funded individual, everything off my own back, nothing to do with the military. Oh, really? I thought they did some sort of a retraining package or is that a sort of thing not included in it or how does that work? I believe, like, as per Sod's law, as I left, there was a, I don't know if it's still going, but there was a scheme whereby the MOD would essentially pay for a for an undergraduate degree. Yeah, that's what I thought. I had already did. just left. Um, so I had a very limited kind of like education package, which essentially amounted to zero benefit or help whatsoever. Guys a little bit better. They may do. Yeah. So when you first joined the military, how old were you when you enlisted? Yeah, I think I was 21 years old. 21 years old. So you were still pretty young yeah. when you first enlisted. I remember when I was writing off, it was like old school handwritten letters from South Africa at the time, snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> Please can I join the UK Armed Forces? Um, and I remember writing on there, I'm 19 years old. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that rigmarole went on for a while. But um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was about 21 by the summer. What was the appeal about joining the UK UK military? Was there not? I'm, I'm obviously in South Africa. They have a military and stuff like that. Mm. Where, were you born in South Africa? Yeah, yeah, I was born and raised. Um, uh, and, and the first time I left South Africa was well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I had left very, very briefly for a holiday abroad. But other than that, it was when I came to join up. <sighs> yeah, the, 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 the South African forces at that time had. And, you know, I don't want to offend anyone, but this was just my perception and my reality from that time uh, as I saw things as a, as a naive 19-year-old. I didn't see an organization in South Africa that I wanted to join or be part of or give my loyalty or efforts to. Okay. Um, not for any political reason, but just professionally the look of it. And I've done a little bit of time um, in, in the equivalent of their kind of TA. Mm. And I thought it was pretty abysmal. Again, that was just my opinion at the time. And I had a very good friend at the time who was going to join the British Paris. And he was just like, I oh, want to British Paris. I join the British Paris. And I was like, dude, no, I'm not interested. I don't want to do it. But very quickly, that mental seed grew. Um, and then, you know what? I was just watching a, watching a program on Discovery Channel very, very randomly one day. And the little boat came across the screen and said, oh, another successful date for the Royal Marines. And I thought, what the hell is that? Royal Marines. So I so got on Google and uh, the rest is history, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so was it the marines that you first joined in at 21 yeah 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 i mean to be fair once i started looking them up i thought like these are the guys for me mm. this is, suits me down to the ground everything was, was spot on they do really pitch themselves as kind of the elite fighting force what's the difference between the military uh, sorry the marines and the standard military um kit wise and everything like that things are changing a little bit but during my time that was all absolutely identical the main thing was just the attitude um, and, of course, the, 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 the physical training that went along with it, the requirements to get in, the length of training, the, the kind of intensity of it. They were not as much as I'd anticipated and wanted them to be, but a, a, an autonomous commando force. So, you know, um, each man is capable of, of successfully carrying about his business in the field and supported, if need be, for days on end, that sort of thing. We don't rely on any mechanized logistics and infantry and um, support and that kind of thing. But yeah, by and large, it was just a culture of very, very, very high standards and unwavering compromise. Um, no, no compromise, you know, just yeah. nothing was ever good enough. So yeah, you're pretty, pretty flat out all the time in, in terms of trying to achieve standards that were... Was that a mindset that kind of, of already agreed with you? I mean, were, did you have any relatives that were in yeah. the military or...? Um, no, I didn't. But yeah, I think growing up, that sort of thing was, was on my mind the, the entire time. I don't know, I went to a pretty competitive primary school, competitive high school and that kind of thing. Uh, I went to an all-boys school. It was very alpha male, rugby, sports, academics. You had to be one of the best if you were to have any respect and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I still to this day, you know, I, I know it's 
cheesy and cliche, but if something's worth doing, it's worth trying to do your best and all that sort of thing. And, you know, that does ring true for me. And I, I, I feel the need I have to do that. So I, I kind of do have to aim for the best that I can. And, you know, quite often I, I do fall short of things I aim for. But I think yeah, that's healthy, though, I, in a weird to... way. I know it can be stressful, but mm. I'm the same. You know, your, your reach should always exceed your grasp. I'm that kind of guy where... Some yeah, people yeah. see it and they're like, man, that's that's such a big audacious thing to be going for. Why, you know, it must be stressful holding yourself to such a high standard. But I, mm. I don't know the right word, but it does, I don't want to say lazy because I don't want to vilify people that don't have those same level of standards, but it just feels mm. so unauthentic if, because you know, some people I'm sure, some of the things you've gone on and done, that's, that's kind of why I got attracted to you really is, it seems really impressive to other people, but some days you know you've not given your best and that can be, that's sort of what stokes the fire for the next day. Is that, is that kind of ringing true? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it is. But it's, it's, you, you're right there. You've got to manage it very, very carefully. And I'm still getting better at it. I'm still pretty bad at it, but I'm improving slightly on, on managing my own expectations mm. because I always expect myself to succeed and to reach those standards. And, and mm. quite often you don't. But yeah, I absolutely have to. Um, you know, like uh, uh, triathlons will come up. Okay, I haven't done one in about a year and a half, two years, to be to be honest. But when I was doing them, they would come up and have the different distances then i'd go geez i can't actually like i know i can physically complete it but i'm going to be hanging out of my ass <laughs> but yes i'm going to do the, the furthest one yeah damn right i'm going to do that one <laughs> and i'll rock up and just like i can slug my way through but i don't feel like i had to do it but i just wouldn't have felt authentic if i didn't do it no. for my own self not for anyone else i never went around telling people hey look i did the hardest one and this kind of thing yeah. But I know, right? You know, you know, and same as, again, it sounds cheesy, but you know if you've done your best or if you haven't. Deep down, you know. You do. And I always say this to people when, when you get in bed at night, you know, late at night, only you will know. You know, when you're in there, when I'm in the gym with clients or something like that, people go, oh, yeah, no, yeah. Ross, you know, I gave it my all. I get, well, okay, if you did, then you did. But, you know, mm. when, you, when you're in competition or even just when you're in competition with the best version of yourself, when you get in bed late at night and you close your eyes and you, your partner's that area, your partner's gone to sleep or you're just by yourself, you'll know. Mm you'll know when you're like, that was a little bit shit. You know, I actually, I pulled yeah, yeah. short there. I didn't give everything I did. And the hardest thing to do is to lie to yourself ultimately. And I love what you said about expecting the best from yourself because you're right. It's not ego. It's not like no. when you expect uh-huh. yourself to win, it's not because, I mean, it, it's often going to happen at the cost of somebody else if you're in a competitive environment, but you expect <laughs> it from yourself all the time. I, I've got it tattooed on my right arm. It says, you know, I'm better than no one and no one is better than me, but I expect the best from myself all of the time. Now, if their best is better than my best, that's okay. But it's very mm. hard to live with yourself. And I think, I don't, do you feel there's a cultural thing that we've kind of vilified success? And I don't mean necessarily financially. I don't mean, and even just like the whole competitive thing, you know, you see it in schools. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got a young son. Yeah. You see it with this whole, you know, competitive driving or it's taking part. You know what? And you've, you've been in war zones. You know what? Taking part, isn't good enough sometimes guys there is winners and losers in yeah, life yeah. and sometimes it comes at the cost of life yeah yeah um it, yeah and i i don't want to necessarily go down the rabbit hole and start a rant that might offend some people but going straight off that just moving on to everyday life you know i figured my thoughts in the war zone but i, I often say to to my work colleagues and I, I say like i don't mean this as a someone who's not <laughs> British or whatever, but this is a genuine thing to people I'm seeing around you. The rest of the world is going to eat you alive. Yeah. If you continue to rely on support from like the government and, yeah, yeah. you know, if, uh, the, the rest of the world is crazy hungry. If you look at a, a world map and look at the number of countries that have free health, free education and are safe, it's actually not very big. No, It's not a big area. There is a lot of the world who are starving hungry, literally, but metaphorically as well. These people are super, super competitive and they are going to, you know, gonna they, 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 they are going to eat your they, life. They, they, they're going to, and you know, they will take your job. And you, you do need a little bit of an edge and a drive like that sometimes, you know, you, uh, individual, the ability to succeed and not physically harm anyone else. Yes. You should do it. Good for you. And it's good to fail as well, as I often do a lot of the times, you know, turn up to a race and I think I've prepared pretty well. I take one look at the rest of the field and think, oh, man, I've not trained hard enough. <laughs> and sure enough, everyone passed me in the back. Like, oh, dude, oh. I think there's an aspect of the, I, I kind of call yeah, it okay. the, the 40% rule where the, I feel like the pass mark in so many things in life now has really been lowered. And I'd be interested to hear what the pass mark was for becoming a vet, to be honest, because I hear some crazy stuff like the pass mark for becoming a doctor is like 50% and a lot of university degrees and stuff like that is... I feel like we've lowered the bar and we've even done it in, in, uh, 
in services and stuff like that in the fire service mm. and I don't know if the military's physical standards have changed but I feel like a lot of places it's dropped down and, and during this past two years certainly during the whole Covidian craziness and all of that it's like the 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 water is rising in the world if you know what i mean it's like things are getting a little bit tighter things are getting a little bit tough the margins are smaller there's less fat around the edges and if you are not swimming you're gonna go under you are gonna drown you know before when i mean whether you're a covid <clears throat> health person or whatever when people are like oh, i don't really need to be that fit i don't need to be that little healthy i don't really need to save money i don't really need to you know be that because the government will look after me or this will look after me. you're like it's not going to do it forever, guys. You know, we've we've yeah, got yeah. used to this cotton. I don't know, like a cotton wool generation, but I feel like we've we've not really realised the position we put ourselves. But now, no, I hear you, man. I'm- crazy, crazy idiots like me and you, and that's what they'll usually be termed as. Oh, you're obsessive. Oh, you're a bit too intense. You're a bit too this. You're a bit too that. They have become the people who now feel a bit vilified because everyone else is like oh my God, this is so hard. This is, I mean, we've got a couple of businesses. We lost the best part of 25,000 pounds last year, but I'm not going to go and bitch and moan about it. I'm not going to go and ask for handouts from anybody. It was my decision. It was my choice to go and do those things. And when people have chosen not to look after themselves, I'm not going to throw them to the wolves and it's not for me or you to do that at all, but they need to take this. I mean, this last two years has been a little bit of an indication of maybe things that may come at some point in time. But they need to be ready for it now. It's a bit like uh, your general health. They say if you survive your first heart attack, you're likely to live on to be a very old person because that should be your alarm bell. That should be like, oh shit, do you know what I mean? I need to get my health on track. I need to sort my nutrition out. I need to sort this out. That Mm. that should be the big warning. And I feel like there's kind of a, a, a societal thing where we're sleepwalking into being the last place in in you know we're getting propped up by a system and I don't, we're not going to get political i don't want to yeah. go too too far down this rabbit hole but do you know what i'm saying it worries no, no, me sure. yeah. yeah 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 absolutely man I, I fully agree you know so there's not a lot of fat left and, and it, it, this is not scaring to myself and in fact i i i on purpose fast from the news and i do not consume much news consume the news second hand yeah uh, by major events that may affect me none of which really actually do later so, you know, it's not scaring to myself, but the, the, the world is, is, a, is a zone graphically. Have a look at it. I said it earlier. If you generally look at a world map, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of places, whether it's political, whether it's socioeconomical or not, a lot of people in trouble. And there's, there are limited resources. We're living a life of Riley, uh, you and I, and, and, you know, fortunate, privileged people like, like you and I, and, and probably most people listening. Uh, but there may come a time, firstly, it may or may not, you know, it's just not prophesizing anything but there may probably will come a time where when things become tighter here mm. um but the second point is if you are strong you're in a position to be kind and you're in a position to help other people you know if you are the one who's at the back of the march and you can't carry your pack you ain't in a position to help the next struggling no. if you're the one who's trained and you're the strongest one you don't have to go eating all the food you don't have to get to the water stuff first drink all the water start pulling people you know what you can actually be like you know what? I'm strong and secure enough to be kind and support those who genuinely need it. Uh, and that's another reason. And, and also for parents, you know, I try and keep myself physically and mentally sharp and fit. Never as much as I want to, relating to our previous point. But, you know, I try and I'm, I'm pretty much getting it right. Because I want to be able to support my, uh, my son. You know, uh, we've just been through a pandemic. You know what? It may have been a case that stronger people or, or, or those who were less prepared may not have done so well. Again, I don't want to, you know... Mate, I totally uh, agree with you. Who, you know, 200 who years ago, people through it. these but, people would have been pushed out of society. And it's not like we wouldn't have pushed them out, but they would have been part of the natural wastage. I love what you said about getting your news secondhand. I'm, I'm 100% the same. That's why I was like nodding away, because if it's so goddamn important, somebody yeah. <laughs> is going to tell me about it. And with the great... I mean, you've been in war zones. Exactly. I've, ne- I've yeah. never been in a war zone. You know, the, the conflicts that are going on in the Middle East at the moment don't tremendously affect me on a personal level. I care. I donate to charity. I donate to the firefighters charity. Yeah. I donate to fallen heroes charity, blah, blah, blah. I'm not, I'm not a priest, yeah. you know, I'm not the best guy in the world. But that, that's, no, no, the, no, that's no, the limitation no, yeah. of my impact that I can make. Whereas people, can, you know, they, I talk about mm. controlled controllables. People worry so much about things that are outside of their control and they, they that adversely yeah, affects the things the over which they have control. You know, the control over their health, control over their finances, sure. control over the relationship with their son, like you're speaking about there. They'd rather talk about things that they've got. Yeah, you, you know, we can't control the taxes. We can't control covid we can't control the wars in the in the in gone off far lands and uh, we can't do anything about that you know but you're not focusing yeah, on yeah, the stuff uh, that you've got control of yeah exactly and uh you know it's not a labor point but it's further example i mean trump and biden oh my god i mean how long did that go on for 
you know what? Honestly, uh, it must have been probably a week before I figured out who had won that election in the end. And <laughs> did I feel bad or, or an idiot that I didn't know? I was actually happy because I'd avoided all of this absolute nonsense. Yes, there's two most powerful men in the world and most powerful country, which is far-reaching ripple effect, etc. It did not, and this is not a selfish thing, this is reality, it did not affect my life right there and then or those I care about. I rather focus my effort on playing with my son than watching that bit of news and letting it upset me. I'm going to get upset enough for stupid things as it is. I yeah. drive to work, someone cuts me off, I'm late, I get pissed off, I swear at the dude in the car next door and I'm an <laughs> asshole to him and ruin his day. And there's enough of that going on. So I don't need to be watching the news and getting in a row with my neighbor because he supports freaking Trump or something, you know? So yeah, it's for that. No, it's I'm recreational negativity, that, yeah. isn't it? That's what I term it as now. It's recreational. Like as people are inventing stuff to get angry about, but I love what, uh, I love what you said about helping people from a position of strength, because like you say, when you're looking after yourself physically, financially and all that sort of stuff, you can only, that's the only place you can help people from. People think it's really selfish, but it's a, it's a complete reverse mindset. I always yeah. think of parents as a really bad habit of this one is some, especially moms sometimes, and they can give, 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 they give financially, they give physically, they give emotionally, and they're just left, you know, just as a hollow shell. Not like they're a hollow person or a shallow person, empty. but yeah. they're empty. They've given too much. To, they've not mm. been selfish yeah. enough and have a good self-awareness to look after yourself, look after your own physical and mental health. You've got to look after yourself. You know, I want to be the person that's stood out in the mm. rain and what, until everyone else has got inside. But if you're frail and weak, you're not going to be able yeah. to do that, are you? You've, you've got to, it's a tough one. You've got to get that mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know that's nail on the head. You cannot help people from a position of, uh, uh, you know, of weakness and instability yourself. It's very difficult to do it. And I haven't been in a, in a financial position to start helping people for very long because, you know, leaving the forces are left with absolutely zero money and then have to, I mean, it's, it's probably a whole book and podcast on its own of how I somehow ducked and dove my way through vet school. How much is vet school? And, that and is, all other that is a hell of a pill to swallow, isn't it? How much is vet school? Um, it, it's actually gone up a hell of a lot more. So I managed to escape the increase in student fees a while ago. You may have heard it went from like three grand a year to nine. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I snuck in just before that, but still... Um, my student debt I had, and this is after six years of, uh, graduated six years ago, and I had a statement the other day, and I've been paying it off pretty much every month since I graduated, um, several hundred pound a month, and the statement was at 42 grand six years after graduating, six years Jesus. after paying it off. It's still 42 grand. I, I don't know how much it was, you know, at its peak, but I think probably 50 grand is <laughs> a fair That's estimate. Mad, and then you think, um, and I know we're going to go and, on to talking about uh, what you did, but you think that then somebody finally, you know, graduates as a doctor or graduates as a vet or mm -hmm. whatever, and they're looked at and they're like, I thought you just did this because you loved it. You know, why don't you just do charitable <laughs> work all the time? And you're like, well, mate, I'd love to, but it's cost, uh, it's cost me 50 grand yeah, to accumulate this knowledge base. And people will expect you to go and do it all. There we are. It's just like, and you're like, oh, I thought you were a good guy, Ross. Oh, oh so man. just about the money, are you? Is that what it's all about? And you're like, I'm so glad you said. Have you any honestly, idea man, I'm, I'm, the level of personal investment that's had to go into <sighs> this? <laughs> and not just money, time. Time away yeah, from my uh, family, I mean, from my children, from my other. No, know. that's exactly it. I, uh, <laughs> and I'm so, so glad and relieved you've said that and that there are people out there other than Beth realize this because it is a daily thing um i'm sure we'll get onto it later but it's probably the single most frustrating annoying infuriating depressing part of being a vet um is this that side of it they want you to come and treat people for free and treat this for free and treat that for free it's <laughs> not like you want to give them an invoice every time but you're like look i work Absolutely. at a, i work at a practice you know i work mm. at a recognized place that yeah. does this uh, yeah i mean i i you know, I try not to do it, but now and again, I do look people in the eye and I, I say, hey, look, sorry about the bill. What I'm about to charge you is pretty expensive, but that's because it is expensive. Mm. Financially, cost me a lot of money to do this. Mm. I've spent a lot. I mean, that 50 grand wasn't the end of it, by the way. I've just spent another 15,000 and probably another 10 grand, uh, 15 on education, 10 grand on equipment out of my own pocket. And the list go on, and, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, it was pretty much a solo effort. Um, yeah, there wasn't wasn't really any support to be honest. Now, uh, I, I, I've got to be fair to my parents. Like morally, mentally, emotionally, they're dead again. You know, the letters I refer to writing off the old days. I remember my dad helping me draft the letter. Don't don't say this, say that. So he helped me with that. Um, 
you know, they paid for my plane ticket to, to come over here and gave me a bit of cash in my pocket. They're like, there you go. This is what you want to do. I mean, carry on. What made you want to go into being a vet after coming out of the military? Had you always had that as a second option or? No, I hadn't. Eh? And I've, um, I, I just quickly say, I I've, I've kind of have always felt until recently, I've kind of stopped it now, but I've always felt a little bit, not, not much, but this is a little bit of guilt and shame of, of, uh, of actually getting into vet school because I hadn't, it hadn't been a lifelong desire like most vet students. You know, they they yeah. wanted to since they were ten years old, and you know, busted their asses to to try and get in. And yeah. actually, I just failed straight in. <laughs> you hear um, that with a lot of things. Is, you hear that with the fire service. You know, people are like, oh, "I've wanted to do it since I was a kid," and they end up applying for like five years straight. And then somebody that yeah, yeah. just rocks out of the military or something might just slot straight into it. And it is a look <laughs> of the draw sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and it's not normally my luck, man. But. Um, yeah, so it's a whole other story, but yeah, just one hurdle after the other fell and it got in. But um, yeah, to answer the question, it was, it was something that, you know, throughout my life had been at the very back of my mind, or one of the things. But, you know, I was more inclined to want to be an engineer or something else growing up rather than a vet. But it was in that 12 month period during which you've got to give your 12 month notice to leave the military, um, to which you frantically start trying to figure out what the hell you're going to do this next chapter in your life. And Why did you want to I leave? To my, what was your incentive to leave? Or what, what, what made um, you leave? You know what? It was a, it was a whole bunch of things. Um, overall, I just felt understimulated, believe it or not. And I actually got bored. Yeah. Um, phys- physically and mentally bored. Mm. Of, yeah, I just camp life wasn't for me and uh, things just weren't busy enough. Um, to be honest I can totally agree with that I think a lot of people have that in a lot of emergency services especially like the fire service you know again you you join and you have an idea of you know kicking down doors and and doing fires and same with (laughs) police you think you're going to be chasing robbers down the streets all the time and you know sometimes 80 90 percent of your job can be spent just speaking to members of the community or like for yourself I suppose it was even harder because like you say you'd be living on base all the time and you'd kind of be living in a bit of a cocoon when you're in the when you're you know deep in the military in the marines it's it must be a little bit like Groundhog Day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I semi kick myself for or, or look back on and say I should have done much better was to do exactly what you do and do outside things yeah. um, until that time. Uh, so I, I think essentially it was a wasted opportunity there. Uh, I try not to look back and regret things because I, I don't regret my time at all. I loved it and had a wonderful time and I would do it a hundred times more if I had a hundred more lives. That's great. I, I should have done. I should have done more things. I should have done extra things. I should have played more sports for or with with the with the Marines or even just done more civilian things, more climbing. I, I was at the beach all the time, fishing and swimming and stuff. But yeah. I should have just done a little bit more to to keep myself mentally busy as well. I think, um, and that that may have helped. But in essence, I, I got bored. But I also got bored of of some of the attitude as well. Um, I got I got frustrated with what I've subsequently realized my fault, but I, I, I thought they were pretty poor at managing people, um, yeah. identifying some of saying I was the talent at like identifying who's good at what, who should go where, who should do what, uh, developing people's careers, like who wants to, who wants to get a, get a course. You know, it was actually very difficult to, to promote yourself or better yourself. You almost, you really have to beg to, to, to get given a course, a training course or something to really? better yourself as a soldier. Yeah. 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 It was like, they were doing you a huge favor. You have to jump through all sorts of hoops to do anything that wasn't either a signal or a fucking chef, you know, uh, mm. which no one wanted to do. But anything else, soldiering, was, was a nightmare to try and get yourself onto. Did you think, um, did you think it was, was a finance aspect or what is it you think that was the big um, barrier? There? It probably was higher up, but I honestly, even to this day, think that it was a laziness and a complacency from, from senior NCOs and from officers. Um, they would say, oh, it's expensive to, to rig up a firing package. Okay, we're going to fire off a few thousand rounds of brass. It's going to cost a bit of money. It's not that much fucking money. Yeah. You fly a helicopter for 10 minutes, it's going to cost 10 times more. Mm. The problem is the admin. You know, you've yeah. got to spend a day doing paperwork and health and safety briefs and stuff, and that's what you don't want to do. Yeah, and that, that's, and, that's and, the absolute and, honest truth of it. I know when you see a lot of managers that I've had in the past do appraisals and stuff like that, they kind of actively steer people away from certain parts of development because a big part of development is having a mentor or a coach or somebody that supports you in that development, you know, guiding you through sure. it. And, and even if it's just an instructor on the course themselves, some people, yeah, they, yeah. they just don't have that appetite for it anymore. And it's it's sad and we have to be so, so careful. We're going through a really unique time 
in the in the British fire service at the minute, or in the fire service in the UK, sorry, that there's a lot of new recruits coming through. A lot of new recruits. Yeah. This whole thing's kind of cyclic, and I imagine you see it in the military as well, where people come in, they have 20, 25, 30 year careers, and then all of a sudden mm. there's a few hundred or thousand people that all come up for retirement or all come to leave at the same time, and you get a new massive wave of recruitment. And this sure, is... Yeah in ways it's, it's, it's kind of like a fork in the road it's gone one of two ways for those people like sad people and this I'm, I'm using the words like sad because it sounds even so annoying and, and perhaps a bit guilty that I use these words that those sad obsessive people like me are loving this time because you've got <laughs> loads of new recruits coming in they want to do all the courses they want to get out there they want to yeah. do the drills they want to go in the smokehouse they want to put the, the BA sets on they want to do all that and then you've got the other people that like to speak about developing people and don't actually like the idea of getting out there and walking recruits through, you know, big oh, smoke houses yeah. or, or get sorting out all the equipment to get it prepped and go and do a line rescue exercise or something like that. Because it's a ball ache if, if you don't want to do it. If, oh, yeah, if yeah. it doesn't still, you know, tickle your pickle, if it's not still exciting for you, then it's just, you're like, well, I'm going to get paid the same just to sit on station, just to sit on base. So why would I create work for myself? And that's a really dangerous thing position yeah. if you have that mindset especially if you're leading people and you've got that mindset it can be so hard yeah. for those people like yourself like you say that that, that want to grow that want to develop yeah and and, and that's that's it's tying to another uh closely related point I, I didn't want to become one of those people who was sat there doing a job that they weren't absolutely passionate about <sighs> because for me getting paid was a bonus i just loved to be there i yeah. loved the fact that i was surrounded by the men i was surrounded with the fact that, uh, you know, okay, the, the caveat was it, overall it was a bit too quiet for me. But, yeah. you know, when we did go fast roping out of helicopters and even just doing basic stuff like nav exercises, uh, exercises and stuff like that, I loved it. Yeah. And uh, I, got, I got paid for it. But at the end of the day, I thought, you know what, when I stopped loving it and when I got annoyed enough, I thought, I don't want to be one of these guys who's like, uh, you know, sergeant, color sergeant, whatever, who's just grumpy and pissed off and he's counting down five years to retirement. Yeah. So I, I, I want to be, if I get deployed, I want to be burning to get out there and yeah. burning to get on the ground and do it. Um, and I reached a point through the various frustrations where that was no longer the case. And I thought, you know what, I've got to go before I stop loving it. You know what, mate, um, you, you, you're like, you're speaking straight to me. This is like, this is a private coaching conversation because I worry about that so much, you know, and, and a yeah. lot, I work with a lot of great positive people, but I also work with arguably a large percentage of people that are disenchanted with the job. Sometimes sure. they don't enjoy it and it's, it's really toxic. And I, I think of it, but like a slow death, it's like, you've got to be yeah. like you were saying, you don't want to become one of those people, but it's a little bit like, it's like if you touch the goo in the alien film and it starts crawling up your arm, you're not sure. Mm. I don't know when it will engulf you and you won't know that you've been engulfed. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you can be like, oh no, Ross, I'm, I'm relentless. I'm super positive. These people don't affect me. But it's like you and I said about the news. Even if you think, I mean, this is how the whole multi-billion pound market of subliminal marketing works. It's going in. It's going into yeah, your yeah, yeah. mind, Ross. You know, Pete, you know, it's, yeah, even if yeah, I'm yeah. like, no, I'm positive. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody thinks. Yeah, okay, Pete. But it's still going in. You're being around it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. bleeding into your mind. It's permeating your thoughts, your perspectives, how you see the world. It is. It is. It does just deepen. And, and oh, yeah, I did in those last 12 months probably, to a very mild degree, become one of these kind of people. Um, mm. Started to get bitter and pissed off. Um, and, and and I just knew it's definitely I need to go. Um yeah initial discussion about competitiveness and ambition you you can have good intentions and be ambitious it's okay yeah it's good be okay with it you can like you're going to do some good i mean i've got uh, pipe dreams in my mind that probably will not materialize but i've got pipe dreams in my mind of good that i want to do it's not all ultra uh, altruistic a lot of it's selfish because i get a buzz from doing good uh, and i don't know why but i feel i feel good about it i get a reward from yeah, so I, I, that's my motivation as well to keep doing it. But yeah, you, you can. And if you don't uh, put yourself forward, rise above, stick yourself through the grind, you're not going to be able to influence stuff like that. Yeah. So jumping back to you, you'd had that moment, you'd started to feel that uh, sort of those walls of negativity a little bit, not totally, but sort of closing mm -hmm. in around you. You'd got enough yeah, self-awareness yeah. to know something's got to mm -hmm. change. Uh, you decided to make make the jump. You left. You went through the personal investment. You decided that you were, you were going to become a vet. How how did you know what you were going to do once you'd qualified? I didn't. 
Um, <laughs> it's it, it, uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it, honestly, it's funny when I look back, and I mean, it's only been six years, but how very, very different my kind of anticipations and, and, and expectations were from even the position of being a final year vet student last month away from graduating yeah. um, to the reality of where I've ended up now. Um, I said this to one of my colleagues yes, uh, the other day, in the, in the final, just as an example, <clears throat> in the final year, you've got to write, a, they give you a list of like 15 different clinical rotations. You put them one to 15 as a, in order of priority that you want to do and spend the most time on. Mm. And so I remember at that point, uh, I put number 14 and 15 as soft tissue surgery, like 14, yeah. and ophthalmology, number 15. I was like, oh, I just want to spit and vomit if I even see or hear those words. It's terrible. <laughs> I don't want to even go near a theater. I don't want to know anything about the eyes. It's boring. I just, it's crap. It doesn't interest me. It's rubbish. I just don't enjoy it. I want to do cows. And horses and yeah. How many how many lions fish. need operating on? I'll do some lions. <laughs> they must be every yeah, day. Yeah, okay. I just, just wanted to get out and have a crack. Um, fast forward six years. I mean, I actually have got a, a an, an additional life, uh, qualification post grad thing in, in in fish medicine, very very randomly and absolutely useless. But, <laughs> I, have, but I haven't. I've treated one fish um, in the six years. One fish for free. Oh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually prefer soft tissue surgery now to anything else. And I've just spent four years and best part of 20 grand advancing my skills and uh, becoming a certificate holder in ophthalmology, uh, ironically. So, yeah, I, it, it didn't it didn't pan out how, how he wanted, um, you know, but that's the story of most of my life, really. I could never have predicted that right now I'd be living in the UK in this part of Wales doing what I do. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's just like the... The river of life is kind of, I've just jumped in and gone, all right, see so where we end up. When you talk about that river of life, uh, so obviously my attentions first came to you from some of the incredible work you've been doing in war zones as a vet, which is kind of a strange, uh, a strange sort of duality. You know, you're going somewhere to give aid and everything. Wonderful, you know, and it's, it's much needed in these war zones. But what made you want to go back into that after you, you'd qualified? How did all of that happen? Um, yeah, it was, it was still, it's trying to, trying to combine skills really. And, um, I don't know, maybe it's some sort of deep seated psychological, uh, thing that I need to be needed or something like that. I don't know, but I, I like to feel that I am doing something tangibly good and effective. Yeah. It makes a difference. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in the military, you were part of a, you know, you might have been a tiny little, uh, tooth on a tiny cog, but you still were. Mm. And you thought you were, had an important job. And often you did, not always. But anyway, you, you kind of like were supposed to matter, right? Uh, and you were there for the greater good and this big cause, uh, part of this big team. Uh, fast forward to veterinary, like, what actually am I? Uh, you know, what am I doing? How am I helping? Plus, you know what? I thought I was bored in the military, but I'm actually super bored right now. Uh, <laughs> my day job is stressful, but I'm still bored. Yeah. I'm still bored doing it sometimes. So what can I do? And also, how can I differentiate myself from other vets? Not on a competitive basis, but... Well, um, yes and no. Do you know what I mean? What's that USP? What's, you know, what's going to be different about yeah, me? Because else, there's other areas that need to happen. Offer? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. You know, uh, so everyone wants to become an orthopedic surgeon and uh, charge three or four grand for sawing bones and hammering and drilling shit. Cool. And that's amazing Oh, is that work. the guy? Who was the guy that did that TV show about that? Yeah. It was probably years and years ago. Want to, that was yeah, like crazy. Yeah. Some of that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. you didn't want you didn't want to go down that route because I'm sure it was no, heavily, heavily no. populated with uh, with people all trying to make it a name is. for themselves. Um, so, but I just thought, you know what? I do miss the military, regardless of what I do not say. I had a fantastic time, and I do miss not not necessarily it as an institution, but I, I miss that sort of activity and action. Yeah. I miss a little bit of the right kind of stress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how can I bring the two together? Um, well, I joined the Royal Marines Reserves for a few years. It was not my cup of tea at all. Uh, you know, we'll say no more on that, but it just, it just wasn't my, my vibe at all. Okay. Very, very different to, to, yeah. to full-time commando unit life. Very, very different. Not my cup of tea. So we ended our relationship there. And, um, I just <laughs> we thought, haven't well, spoken what else since. can I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, 
and then uh, yeah, I just started thinking, and, and I, you know, it's the same how I get into vegetable. I get these ideas in my head, and then I start like persistently just digging and scratching until I find something, a little thread of something I, I pull on, and, and next thing I know, I find myself in Kabul at this God, I love freaking that. like clinic, and I, I, I've just graduated, by the way. Like I don't know anything about anything. Just graduated vet school. I don't know how to do anything. I'm like, oh Jesus. <laughs> I'm on my own out here in Kabul, trying to, people think I know what I'm doing as well. <laughs> you've got um, all the gear, all the gear and no idea, you know what I mean? You've got the yeah, theories, pretty much, you've, you've got yeah. the book knowledge, but uh, you haven't sliced anything open pretty yet. Pretty much. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just uh, trying to trying to amalgamate some past skills, you know, like I have a skill of surviving in arduous environments and, and some tactical knowledge and awareness and that kind of thing. How can I combine it, you know? Am I needed somewhere else? Can I do any good? Can I do something at school? You know, now and again that I'm going to, enjoy in a different way to the day job so yeah it just kind of made, made sense to to try and combine the two so where did that where did you go for you say you went to Kabul. was that part of a of a charitable aid work or was that yeah. alongside the military or how did that work no it was nothing to do with the military ironically um there was is a, a guy who just out of kind of coincidence i happened to have been in the same unit as him on the same tour in Afghanistan. Um, didn't know him, wasn't his friend, never spoke to him, nothing like that. He was a higher rank than me. <clears throat> um, but I found out afterwards, like halfway through vet school, I found out this guy had actually started some sort of a, a kind of a charity for helping soldiers bring home the dogs from Afghanistan and also trying to wow. set up a little bit of a local clinic there. So I banged him an email and I said, I'm going to graduate in like a few months or whatever it was. <clears throat> um, I don't really necessarily know what I'm doing, but if you want, I'll come out and see what I can do and help you guys out. Uh, you know, obviously it's free and everything. I don't expect you to pay me anything, but yeah. if you want me to come and dive in, then, then let me know. And yeah, the rest of the history. So I went out there for a few weeks um, and met a, a lady called Louise that I'm still in almost daily contact with uh, she was a kind of a manager there uh, an expat in Birmingham wow. and I stayed in touch with her and then through her I've been doing these other things um, so she she stopped working with or for that particular organization and moved on to work with other people and I've kind of just gone with her so what was that initial work when you went out there because I know a lot of the work was to do with rescue dogs but to what extent yeah. was it, were these just Dogs that have been abandoned, or were they wild, or was it? How, Both, how did it really. Happen? So, yeah, I mean, in, in these countries, there's a huge, huge, huge um, population and problem with essentially feral dogs. I mean, they they normal domesticate domestic dogs by species, but they 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 feral. They've never had an owner or anything like that. And <clears throat> as you can imagine, in a place that's ravaged by war, hunger, disease, uh, poverty. Animal welfare is at the bottom God, yeah. of the list. Yeah, and I mean, it's not just at the bottom of the list, but active cruelty is rough. And uh, we're talking about really savage, barbaric, horrible stomach churning cruelty. In what That's respect? I, mean, I, you know, I don't want us to get super, super uh, graphic. Well, we can do, yeah. but what, what would yeah, people do? Because I mean, I mean, yeah. you hear of dog fights and stuff, but what else can people really do? No. With would they recreationally torture the animal or? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and I don't know why that is, you know, one mustn't say it's a cultural thing or anything like that because equally out there we have wonderful people helping us, but there is cruelty there, a savage level, whether it's misunderstanding the dogs or people themselves who've been abused, I don't know, but, you know, we're talking about um, macheting all the legs off live dogs and leaving them lie in the road, you know, uh, recreationally for fun, smashing into dogs with a car, shooting them in the legs, that kind of thing. It goes on and on. Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and in addition to that, I mean, imagine dogs living in a place like that. Anyway, they're up against it. You know, they're breeding like hell. They, they're getting natural injuries. They're fighting each other. Yeah. You know, one bite from an alpha male, you know, will left you with sepsis and you're going to die a slow death in three weeks' time. They're getting accidentally run over. Um, so th they, they have a huge attrition rate and injury rate as it is without the cruelty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's a huge degree of cruelty going on there. And, and essentially nobody helping. And these dogs, as I said, are breeding. So the problem is just multiplying. Um, but yeah, and, and, and then the, the second thing is the government has a huge problem with it because there's rabies 
around. I was going to say the amount of disease that they carry because when they're yeah, that, when they're that absolutely. feral, is it similar to just a really large mm. rat or something like that? I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's not a not an unfair comparison. Um, so they are a threat, and and the government's approach is to um, either shoot or poison, but it's usually poison. So you know, leaving a tiny bit of meat around just laced with poison. Every dog, you know, for miles around just flops there, and, and they'll essentially just die in the streets. And then, I don't yeah, know, then you've got you've still abandoned. got the biological issue of masses exactly. of animal carcasses everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you see it. You see it. So uh, how on earth it, can you? What, I mean, what was the thought process in trying to um, offer some sort of solution for this? How do you differentiate between animals that are deserving of care? Did, did you work in alignment with any local um, support structures that would refer you to areas, or was it? I mean, how on earth can you even go about making a difference? Formal. Yeah, it, well, uh, that is the question, and I, I still question the difference we made today because it, it's kind of like sticking your finger in the damn wall that's leaking, you know. Um, mm. It's just it's firefighting, really. It's, it's, we haven't haven't got about curing the problem yet. Um, Did so, they ever use them for meat? Yeah, like, no, not in that. Not in that. Yeah, you I don't want to seem barbaric. I know in the UK we see animals. No, not at all. But like, I mean, you see, I mean, again, we don't want to get into an animal rights conversation, but the way we treat some <laughs> of our cattle. Um, some people think it's barbaric and horrible, but in comparison yeah, yeah. to how those dogs lived, I'm sure our cattle probably live quite a lot nicer. And if uh, yeah, yeah, if and they I were can, recognised as a, hard, so yeah. yeah, if they were recognised as a as a as a source of meat, I don't know, maybe they'd I don't know, people look after me could at least deal with the problem because even places like Australia yeah. and stuff, they they struggle with. We think for kangaroos and go, oh, kangaroos are gorgeous, kangaroos are amazing. Apparently, they're Ooh, pests over there. Yeah. Right, there's in it yeah, yeah, like yeah. all over the roads they're you know writing cars off and they they hire people to come in and, and call the herds and it's just yeah it's, there's another form of vermin but it's bloody huge yeah and just so feral pigs as well over there but yeah i know it is it's a good point and i think uh it's just, just my perspective i think that it may be a cultural slash religious thing that the dogs on uh, to date not uh, clean, socially acceptable animals, and there is a lot of physical fear surrounding dogs as well. Ah. Um, so, as in the UK, it's difficult to understand because generally you see a dog in the street and you go, ah, you know, most people, ah, I want to go scratch yeah. his little head and give him a treat or whatever. Generally, people there are, are honestly fearful of the dog. And they, they don't necessarily understand because they've not been exposed to the dogs as, as, a, as, a, as a domestic pet or a friend. Yeah. They don't understand that, you know, they, for them, they see this thing which, you know, people in the UK might look at pigeons like this. I eat dirty buggers, pigeons all over the place. It, it, it might be a similar mindset to that. Yeah. Um, Except it's a lot bigger. Yeah, it's got there's teeth. just not a lot of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's got there's not teeth. a lot of respect or admiration for the dog. It's not looked at as necessarily a sentient being, and uh, I think that level of understanding hasn't extended to to some of these places. It is so, so strange. There is something about the pack mentality, though, because even I domesticated over here but i'm very aware sometimes when i go out especially the two staffies when i go out on my staffies if i i think to myself you know what if i get down to the bottom of the field and they suddenly decide they don't like me they suddenly decide that for whatever reason <laughs> we don't like me today had enough of you that's game over yeah. that is game over these, it is, it these is. are right. they're big balls of muscle they are far strong enough yeah, the, yeah. The, the only thing i've ever got over them is that is that psychological aspect it's that pack mentality they yeah. want to they want to follow that uh that leader, they want to follow the alpha male. And, and you've only ever got that physical dominance over an animal, I suppose. But when I see some of your videos and you're in there, you know, with I mean, 10, 15 wild dogs and you're trying to take a look at a few yeah. of them and see what the injury... I'm thinking, Ross, <laughs> Ross, mate, come on. These are not domesticated animals. And um, yeah. Because you go to places like, or you see some of the footage from some of the wild dogs that run across plains in Africa and whatever in... They're savage, and again, you talk about um, yeah, running with injuries. Honestly. They'll have a broken leg, and they'll just keep going, and they can track animals for mm-hmm. 50, 60 miles, and it is a different animal, and, it, and it's wild. We've we've really it diluted is. and domesticated down what is the traditional an, uh, a dog, I suppose. Yeah, it's incredible, and, and uh, yeah, and they, they are all big dogs out there. You know, they, they, you don't get anything below your kneecaps. Um, wow. They're big dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, honestly, and if, if they want to do some damage, you're going to be in trouble. And there is a pack mentality because they will kill each other. You know, it's 
It, yeah. it is survival of the fittest amongst them. Um, you talk about dogs running around with broken legs every day, driving to the to the shelter in Iraq, which is uh, essentially it's kind of just a breeze block sort of area with some kennels and things. And mm. they, they've developed it and trying to do what they can with very little money. But driving in there, there are packs and packs of dogs, and they are wild as wild could be. You cannot get up to them. But you, you see them there, there's legs literally hanging off by a thread, dogs dragging themselves along. And the others are mauling them and ripping them to pieces, and uh, it, it's pretty savage. Uh, Jesus. So yeah, they they are essentially wild animals, and they're not small. Um, yeah, some of those pens I'll go into, like the local guys who work there, the dogs are used to them. Yeah. I go in there, and I genuinely am scared. Yeah. Honestly. Well, I know when you like, said when you yeah, first went into one of them, was it snowy or something? It bit your leg and yeah, bit, you, bit you in I mean, the ass, was, and you're like, <laughs> what the he hell? Did, he did. He was all right because he was just nipping. Yeah. But it was enough to make me think if this guy, yeah. all he has to do is just get aggressive once and the rest of them are going to take me down. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's several hundred kilos of dog there in, <laughs> in amongst all of them. Um, and there was another big old boy in the pen there who was the alpha and he was not happy in the beginning. Turns out he had a, <laughs> a really bad tooth and a horrid infection, which I managed to sort out. But yeah, that guy was, like bad news when he came bounding towards you I was like right I'm just going to back out and get out of here <laughs> Jesus so how did you go about so, so you, what you, you and well, Louise was it yes Louise yeah yeah did you would you identify yeah. stuff um, on your travels and then try and yeah. try and you know try and hunt it down and, and what do you trank it yeah, do you just much. capture it do you how how did you go about caring for these and identifying them and seeing what was worth because I see you know you'd you'd help them give birth you'd help raise puppies over there mm. but what do you do what do you do with them you know it's so it's such a strange thing because you're like yeah, you know if you see a pregnant animal you're like god we need to look after this vulnerable mom mm. and help them but then you're like but we're overrun with dogs so yeah. would the best yeah. thing not to be to euthanize the animal I, I, I don't know I don't know what the yeah, answer is but it's a, it's a life isn't it's it it's a, it's a birth and you're like I know, it's, it's special it's, I've got to maintain this but then you're like what are you going to do with the 10 puppies uh, I hear you absolutely and you're making very very good points but the, the thing is it's a hell of a position for me and Louise but even more so for me because I'm one step even removed from her outlook and mindset yeah I'm very, so as a vet, you very quickly become um, uh, non-emotional about things. Yeah. You know, as I imagine surgeons are, as I imagine you guys and the rest of your colleagues in emergency services have to be, yeah. have to be for your professionalism and your, and your own mental health. And I'm, I'm very much like that. I do get super bummed out about stuff, but I will flick the switch and I'm grateful I'm able to do so. Flick the switch. I'll be a bit angry about having to do it mm. and I'll deal with the consequences afterwards. Yeah. But uh, Louise is not like that. And, you know, it's a good thing overall because she will, uh, you know, give the shirt off her back to help and keep her life going. Yeah. Um, me, I'm a bit more bigger picture. Yeah. Like, is this you know, life like savable and how long can it be sustained after I've but, had an interaction yeah, with so, it? So her and I will often have you know, discussions and, and on the things that will last many, many days and, and come to agreements and compromises for both of us. But generally, we're on the same sort of page. Mm. However, the biggest divide is between us and local attitudes to euthanasia. The dead, dead, dead against it in most of these places. Yeah. It's a foreign concept and it just, especially when some of the local staff and volunteers have put a heck of a lot of time and emotional um, investment yeah. into, a, into a dog. And I rock up there on day one and I'm like, like euthanize, euthanize, euthanize. Yeah, yeah, you just start days, scoring them off the list euthanase. and go, how old is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's its pre-existing conditions? Go, uh, right, no, we're going to get rid of that one. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go draw up the drugs now. We're going to euthanize that one, that one, that one right now. No, 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 no. And, and you know, it's, it's hard for these people to see this guy just rocks up and he wants to kill this thing. Yeah. He's supposed to be a vet, and the trouble is, I need their buy-in and respect um, because I need their best work out of them. Do you do, do you see? To help me out. Is there much of a challenge just to skip forward for a second? Mm. Now you exist in a civilian world, and you do predominantly a, a lot of your work at a, a general practice of some form. I imagine. Yeah. Do you, yeah. That must be a really, really tough one because I see this a lot with with pets. You know, even just walking around my estate, you know, 
you see some dogs and you're like, man, that dog does not want to be alive. That dog is struggling. Yep. That dog is severely yep. overweight and you are pouring mm-hmm. thousands of pounds into it just because it's a source of your happiness. But the animal hasn't got a voice. Yeah. And do you, do you yeah. ever have this? There must be a real professional yeah. battle in your mind when it comes to this person is affluent enough. They want to keep this. They want to sustain life in this animal, but it's 16 years old, dog, whatever. And you're like, this is not, you know, this isn't kind anymore. Yeah, no, very, very good point. And, 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 and honestly, it's an almost daily occurrence for most of us. Um, not, not unique to me as a vet, but veterinary in general. Yeah. Um, it's a huge thing. Um, and then it's, 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 it's this complex issue because, you know, you've not only got you and your feelings as a vet, but of course the, the animal owner, but both of you have got complex things going on. You know, as a vet, you want to want to be non-emotional and say, listen, you know what? I'm just calling it black and white. This, this thing needs to go. Um, but then you've got the guilt that you can't help. You've got the guilt that you're going to cause untold upset to this person plus they're going to not trust you they're going to think that you are a bad person and generally i don't really care if people think i'm a bad person yeah um but when they're your client you need their buy-in you do need it not not for their for their, for their income and return business but you need them to do what you say yeah. so you need them to respect and trust you because it's kind of a, a lot of the time it ends up being a negotiation yeah. like okay we, we're going to keep the dog going but i need you to pay for this medication yeah, and, and I need you for, to give for, the dog the medication. Not when you come back in a week's time yeah. and you're like, oh, it doesn't really exactly. want, doesn't really want to take it, doesn't want to have it. Mm-hmm. It's not a flipping option. Yeah, and I need starve the dog if exactly. it's not going to eat it. Then put it in this food and, and feed it to the dog. But people right. they struggle with there that. Is, there's no ways I can force it, you know. Um, and 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 you 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 know I've had it in very rare occasions. But sometimes you have to start mentioning RSPCA and things like that. Then, but the minute you do that, the, the trust goes out the window. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's often a very complicated and fine line to tread there to try and keep their buy and keep their res- professional respect anyway so that they're at least going to do some of the stuff you ask them to do. Yeah. And they're going to come back and they're going to pay for doing it. You know, it's not the NHS. These people are paying. And yeah. often it is expensive. Do you um, ever find a difference no. between general public and, say, today, like the agricultural sector and farmers? Because a lot of incidents we attend, Huge, whether yeah. it's a... Um, you know, an animal trapped in a river or I went to a sure, horse, yeah. a horse stuck in a cattle grid a long time ago. Uh, there'd classic, been, yeah. um, there'd been some people break into, uh, this person's land and they'd gone through their shed just to yeah. steal some power tools and whatever. And they'd left the gates open and the horse had, yeah. um, shot off and it gone across this cattle grid, yeah. fallen over and got its legs trapped in the cattle grid. And we, before That's the, nasty. before, yeah, it was nasty. Before the, the, um, vet was called, there was like a neighbor there that used to ride this horse and, I find that people, the um, sometimes the owners, but often more somebody that just loves the animal and you know is infatuated with it, can be a bit of a hindrance yeah. when you're at an incident because they're like, "Oh no, just let me let me be with it because it'll it'll be calm." And I've seen someone nearly get knocked out when a horse has uh, leapt its head up because obviously they use their head a lot of times to try and get up, and it nearly knocked this woman out because she was trying to calm, oh, yeah. she was trying to calm it down, and I'm like. Just stand over there, please. The horse doesn't know you're here. It can't connect with you. It can't identify you. It's panicking. It's going to hurt you. You need to stand here. You need to stand in these safe areas where you're not going to get hit, where you're not going to get... We need to pin its head down, otherwise it's going to keep trying to get up. And eventually when the farmer got there, he just looked at it and he was like, just bolt it. He says, don't don't bother yeah. trying to lift the cattle grid or trying to spread the bars. Yeah. He says, it's broke. It's like, it's, it's, just, just shoot it. And yeah. that was it. We'd been there for about an hour. We got all the kit out and stuff because you know we're not we're not <laughs> doctors and we're not vets, so we can't pronounce no, death and we, we can't yeah, say yeah. it's not worth saving. And we were ready to cut yeah. this and extra get and all that sort of Do stuff. And the vet just came over and and did it. And uh, and you think it, yeah. good decision, good decision. Um, and sometimes yeah, yeah. owners or other people are such a hindrance because that it's again we talk about selfishness. This is when the pendulum does swing because it's very selfish to try and sustain a certain animal's life when it's it's not going to live a life of happiness anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's a daily discussion, the quality of life thing. It's, uh, and and I, I always tell people, uh, and this is one of the few advantages that we as vets have over our, our human doctor colleagues. Um, yeah. you know, they, they generally have more advanced practices, knowledge, abilities, et cetera, et cetera, and facilities. But we have the ability to end this in a peaceful, calm, professional, 
manner. There's not going to be a court Human involved. There's not going to be anything else involved. Yeah, and, you can just say this is in the best interest. And I say to them, look, you and I are probably not going to have great death. You know, morbid to say it, but let's just face it. There's a let's fair chance yeah. you're not going to die happy or, or in, a, in a nice way. I can guarantee you, and I don't guarantee much in, in medicine, but I can guarantee you that I can end this in a really super peaceful, calm way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's a discussion because, yeah. it, it, and I, I don't blame them. For and it. I think we would all we would all like that if it were done to ourselves. You know, we all talk about hmm. people about you know if you have a debilitating injury or something like that. At the end of the day, the body is just a big soup of chemicals, and like you say, you could put the body in a state where you overwhelm it with a chemical that puts it at peace, and then you just transition it until life life is yeah. extinct we we as people are yeah. not going to have that privilege in most instances unfortunately and again yeah. people think it's morbid but it's, it's going to happen to us all at some point it's going to happen so i don't wish it yeah. upon myself or anybody else i'm certainly not looking forward to it um but i'm very aware of it because it also when we echo back to drive and purpose it gets it helps me get shit done because i'm not here forever yeah yeah that's very good point and that's one of the things that i don't know why uh kind of uh go off on a bit of a tangent here and change the topic slightly but yeah I don't know I don't know why but just over the past several months yeah my finite life has become very very um it's just just ringing very very loudly in my ears yeah. so I'm not here forever and I've just got a more of a kind of carpe diem seize the day attitude about me Mate, ta- it's tattooed on the day. inside of my left um, bicep and that doesn't mean anything like as always but I always put something on, my, on, the, <laughs> on the back of my left hand I'm just like a walking flipping positivity thing honestly it's a bit garish yeah, sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got do more written on the back of my left hand <laughs> I've got be the difference on read the back my of- bicep <laughs> read it read it <laughs> <laughs> I'm that guy. I am that guy, honestly. No, I'm, it's I'm true, man. It's, it's, it just reminds me, though. You know, we're, we're not here forever, guys. And, and on the other bicep, it says, if not now, then when, in like a really cool little way. It just makes me laugh. And I quite like, honestly, if if I all I ever get from it is that when somebody sees it, they go, oh, what a dickhead. And they smile when they're saying it. You know what? <laughs> that, that's it. That's a win for me. That was worth it for me. Because I do the same. I see it and I'm like, yeah, you know what, Pete? Today might be the last day. You know what I mean? Not because I'm taking silly actions or anything like that. People forget how much they, they walk this thin line. You drive at 50, 60, and all that separates you from the other person is a thin white line. How much trust yeah, yeah. You, you are unconsciously placing in the rest of the universe because that person, you don't know what you don't know them. They might be a drug addict, they might be drunk, they might yeah. be they might be asleep, they might be on the phone, and they could they could end it all like that. And people yeah, no, think true, no. they think we're here forever. They're like you know, I, I struggle with my family sometimes and they're like, what are you doing on Saturday? I'm like, I'm busy. I'm not, if you want to do something, I'll do it. Tell me, do, yeah. do, ask ask the right question. Say, Pete, would you like to come over for a yeah. barbecue on Saturday? <laughs> then it'll be yes or a no. But I'm not just sitting in my house waiting for someone to yeah. come and come and give me something to do. <laughs> I'm not, you know, and people I think, know, like, oh, you're such a dick. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm getting stuff done. I'm engaged in my life. You know, when I talk to people, I'm, I'm like, living, man. I'm what are you most that, excited yeah. about? What are you looking forward to? And they're like, oh, God, Pete, it's so exhausting. I can't have this conversation every single time. I'm like, but what are you excited about? What are you, what are you looking forward to? What's happening next week? What's happening, you know, what's driving you? And some people, I think it's actually they feel a little bit scared or they feel a little bit upset that they feel like they haven't found this thing that, that actually is an intangible thing because my you're like you're saying your goals change month to month week to week triathlon vet this yeah, yeah. that it's not because oh god ross is living his life all over the place no he's, he's he's acting on his impulse but it all still acts in the same sort of strategy you want to be here and, and make a difference and the way that you're challenging yeah, yourself yeah. is doing that yeah 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 i mean <laughs> it, it, it's just, I, and I think all, all my life I've done that. I, I have gone through phases of, you know, teenagers or looking back and thinking oh, I was a bit lazy. I wasn't. I played rugby. I was very, very active and I, I, I did actually work quite hard at school and stuff. But uh, generally, it's a foreign thing for me to not be like that. Yeah. I, I'm always busy. Always, always. Yes, it's got, it's got detrimental side effects and I am getting slowly better at managing it and identifying it and learning to, to, to be better it's at managing the, it. Uh, <clears throat> define a detrimental um, outcome for me, just so we can clarify on that. So, well, for, in this particular context, um, I, I, I cause myself to stress by allowing the, the busy lifestyle to become chaotic and the chaos will build on chaos. Um, so... I, I struggle to keep it organized. 
yeah. because there are so many variables that any one thing will throw the rest out. And sometimes I need to also be flexible at the same time. So planning, I mean, super organized will often fail, but you know, this is the, the chaos will beget chaos. Uh, and it's probably a strong word, but it, it culminates in me being forgetful, physically forgetful. Yeah. Oh, I'm people like that. get pretty pissed off. Like, yeah. you know what? I forgot, I forgot my mother's birthday. Like, that's pretty oh, no. shit of me. Oh, All I'm I had terrible. to do was phone. I didn't have to buy a present or do anything. Um, uh, you know what? And actually, this is true. As we sit here, I've forgotten to pay my taxes again. <laughs> like, again. I've got, I've got three. I mean, yeah, seriously. It just reminded me. Like, shit, I need to do this. Oh. Again, I've forgotten. I owe the HMRC money. Yeah. And I'm I need, terrible, All I need mate. to do is pay them. I have the money. I just need to go and pay them, and it's online. I don't need to go back. Anyway, um, that sort of thing, and it just causes me stress, you know. And you lie down in bed and go, ah, oh, bugger! I've tried to to do my wind down in my night routine so I can sleep, and I shit! I've just realised this again yeah. today. Yeah. My scheduled relaxing time. I always find myself rushing to relax. So this weekend is a prime example. I'm genuinely quite anxious until last night, what I was going to do this weekend. I, I, essentially, I'll get one weekend to myself out of every four <clears throat> where I'm not working or have my little boy. Yeah. And this weekend is it. And I'm like, dude, it's sunny weather. It's a bank holiday. I have to make the most of this. I owe it to myself and to the life. I've got to do this. And then, you, and then you agree so to do a podcast stressed. with me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was why I was like a bit of a mission trying to figure out when am I going to do it? When am I not going to let this guy down? Um, uh, and tomorrow I've got to go to West Wales. I don't have to. Like I want to go and explore West Wales. It's in beautiful beaches and I need beach in my life. So tomorrow I've got to do that. But in order to do that, I've got to do my admin, get my tent sorted. Shit, where am I? I don't have a barbecue yet. Oh, man, I've lost my freaking swimming wetsuit. And you've got uh, to do your taxes. Okay, I've got to, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do my taxes. Uh, mate. So, uh, you know, but this should be a relaxing weekend. Um, but actually, it's turning into a slightly anxiogenic one. Now, when we finish today, and plus I've got, uh, you know, some surgeries I want to practice today, and so I'm getting all my admin and work done today. And tomorrow, from literally 6 a.m. sharp, I must relax. And I Absolutely. must be enjoying myself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you find that so sometimes when you have time I, I with the kids, with you almost think like, yeah. right, I'm with my daughter now. Time to have fun. Start having fun. Do fun yeah. now. Fun, yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Press play. And you're like, <laughs> I should have been having fun the last 10 minutes. Why this yeah. happen? <laughs> um, but so I, I'm, a, I'm a bit crap at a teeth, to be honest with you. And I wish I've tried several times to have a diary. Um, and I just often get oh, right mate, in it. Honestly. Yeah, I think I need to just practice, but. You wish do. I could show you, but our video's gone down, but I've got a huge, big, old-school paper calendar, year calendar, yeah. and uh, I keep it out on my dining room table. I fold it out like a big, giant map, and that's got all my different... I felt quite proud. I color-coded some of the stuff in there. Oh, I had four, found four work. colored highlights. Beautiful work. Well done. Like, oh, mate, I'm so <laughs> Make it up. sustainable, though. Make it uh, sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is why well, I have it on my phone. I'm going by now. I know it's all about how we work as in like if you're, you're a kinesthetic, if you're a visual person, it's, it works a little bit differently. But mine has to be with me almost all the goddamn time. Not because I like get worried if it's not with me. But when somebody says to me, mm. hey, dude, Saturday, three o'clock, I need to have a look. Because I'll just say, yeah, absolutely. And then my wife will be like, you've got Lily on Saturday or you're at work. You're on a 12-hour yeah, day. And I'll be like, am I? When was that in? Well, your shifts have been the same for the last three years. So <laughs> it's always been in. <laughs> I'm like... Oh yeah, you're right. Oh, okay, yeah, I might, I might have to let him down. I, I need to. Um, I think I need to get up to to speed with it. I'm a bit of a techno bit, really, to be fair, technophobe. But yeah, I wish I wish to be the guy who has all his stuff on his phone, like you. Yeah, that's an aspiration of mine. I yeah, truth be told, honestly, it doesn't so make it bulletproof, that, but it makes it it makes it good. And and when you're operating, I know in your professional capacity, you will already be doing this, but like. When I when I try and operate with people that are a different level in life, whether that be a different level financially stuff like that, mm. they won't tolerate bullshit. Do you know what I mean? And I don't tolerate bullshit to yeah, a certain yeah. extent, but I'm like, they won't. When you say, "Oh God, I can't. I have no idea what I'm doing next week," some people look at you like you've got a third arm, and they're like, oh, "Yeah, yeah." Sorry, yeah. I thought yeah. I was talking to a professional. Sorry, I, I, I obviously mm. mis misinterpreted who I was talking to, and you're like, "Oh shit, yeah." <laughs> I really should have an understanding of what's going on next week. Even like dates, though. People ask me when I started the fire service. Yeah. I'm like. I don't know, 13, 14 years ago? They're like, don't you know the date? I'm like, no. 
I've actually got my kids' birthdays <laughs> tattooed. I'll, I'll send you a picture of it, right? There we go. I've got my birthday down the middle, and I've got um, my wife's and my children's that run through it. It kind of works really well as like a visual grid, just because the numbers matched up. It was a kind of a cool idea. Because um, I just forget. <laughs> I, I've got no idea how old my daughter is. I know she was born. I know when her birthday is. But Christ, like, she's seven. Is she eight? I don't know. When people say, "What year yeah, is she?" In? I'm like, <laughs> "She's in pri- she's in primary school, isn't she?" I don't know what year she. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Not because I don't care, but it's not relevant. No, but essentially, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it doesn't, it doesn't. But also, do you find sometimes, you know, when you hear this, um, you know, I need to learn how to relax. I need to learn how to slow down. I've got so many people who are telling mm-hmm. me slow down, slow down. Do you sometimes think? Yeah, yeah. And I have this, and again, it might sound a little bit bad to anybody that's not uh, in a in a similar mindset. When people say, like I've had it with my parents sometimes, oh, you know, you don't you find it's hard to fit in when you're at work or something, Pete? And sometimes I'm like, have a think about the type of people you want to try and fit in with. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Are you, are you yeah, the people sure. you're trying to fit in with, are they happy? Are they living an engaged yeah. life? Are they, are they excited when they get up in the morning? They're looking forward to stuff. And if you are and they're not, then why are you trying to fit in with them? Why are you trying to adopt yeah, habits yeah, yeah. and behaviours that you already know the destination, you know they're not happy? So why why would I try and perpetuate that? Why would I try and replicate their behaviours? Because it's inevitably not going to make me happy. And it's, it, it is strange. And it's difficult when the vast majority of people are doing things that happen, don't excite them. And, and I feel for them. I desperately wish they would. Yeah. I, we live I in do. such I mean, an affluent I, society. We have, if, people, if people don't like the job, like the fire service, like the military, if you don't like it, stop doing it. You know, I'm not yeah, encouraging everybody cool. to go on the doll, but you know, if no, you no, don't but... enjoy what you're doing, you haven't got to do it. God, we live in such a rich, diverse society now. You could, you could, you could make money. <laughs> you can make money. You yeah, can make yeah. money just talking to people. <laughs> you can make money on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you could make money doing anything. You know, if, if money was your thing, you know, be anything. Mm. You be a seamstress, make dolls. You know, I don't know, garden for somebody else. Do anything. You haven't got to do things you don't want to do all of the time. There's a great bit of mental resilience that you build from doing challenging things. Now we should all do challenging things, but not something you viscerally hate that you don't enjoy and you're you're contractually obliged to do it for a long period of time. I mean, come on, that's is that not insanity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fully man. I fully hear you. I mean, sometimes even in my job, I think uh, we're all guilty of this. So I think most of us anyway. And you think, oh man. You know what? Actually, my job sucks. Oh, <laughs> yes, man. Why? Wow, what am I doing? What am I doing? Um, well, I, I, at that point, I just go like, right, reality check. Um, I put a tiny little thing on Instagram as a, as a joke the other day. And I tried to change. Um, uh, it was late one night. I was finished showering, pulled the cord, and fucking snapped. Was, oh, dude, the shower is stuck on with one of those stupid pull cords that disappeared in. <laughs> So anyway, the next day I dismantled it. I put the mains off. I thought, I got this. I didn't have a screwdriver. I used a kitchen knife. I, I, um, I almost rewired it the wrong way because the replacement part I bought was completely different. But anyway, the point I'm getting at is I was like, actually, this would suck if this was my day job all the time. Oh, yes, no. I would have more equipment and I'd know what I was doing. But I don't like having to unscrew this thing and balance and fiddle with these fucking wires because I'm trying to pull this busted wire and it's not long enough. Yeah. And it's pissing me off. And it's some people do love that. Surgery, some can... people do love that. But yeah, yeah. It's do. knowing what you enjoy. And when you find something you don't enjoy, for God's sake, stop doing it. For God's sake, stop doing it. Some people love yeah, yeah. gardening. They love agriculture. Do you know what I mean? I don't like going and digging in the garden. I like doing it with my daughter for about an hour. But I don't okay. want to do it every single day for somebody else that, that I have no emotional attachment to. But some people love it. And, you know, we're, historically we're, we're green-fingered beings. You know, some people want to be out there. Writers, I couldn't sit and write. You know, I would, it would bore me to death. I don't yeah. think I'm that interesting. But some people love it. And, and like you say, it's, it's finding what suits you and, and being able to be brave enough and audacious enough to go for it. Because you can, I think it was Jim Carrey that said, you know, you can fail at something you don't enjoy. You know, his dad was a yeah. was a great comedian, and he um, spent his life as an accountant until in his fifties, I think it was, whereas he was uh, let go and fired, and his family really, really struggled. And he'd spent his life dedicating it to something that he didn't even enjoy. You know, you might as well yeah. fail at something that you love. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and the other thing is tying into that is it sounds a bit preachy and judgmental enough, but I think it, I'm I'm partially guilty of this part as well, but of of not doing enough outside things that actually do make you happy or might counteract that unpleasant job that you've got or mm. job that you're not passionate about but you're okay with. In climbing, they call it happiness in the valley. So it's just kind of like, look, I can't climb that peak and get euphoria. I'm down in base camp or in the valley. 
but I've still got to do something to be happy. I can't always wait to be doing something, go on that one holiday a year, or two holidays no. a year. I, I can't live my life in anticipation, waiting to go to that concert or that gig or for freaking Christmas. You've got to try and make yourself happy every day um, yeah. by doing tiny, small little things. Um, for me, it's like trail running. I've recently uh, rediscovered weights, and I'm actually really loving that. And other little tiny things, pathetic things. Uh, I'll go no, and spend no, no, a half no. an hour in the woods. Yeah, but no, they're they're really yeah. important. Thing. I love it. Yeah, you're doing your archery and stuff like that, and just, uh, just yeah, exp- yeah, yeah, exploring that, that aspect of it. That's awesome, mm. and that's what I love about having different things because I, you know I get drawn out with the fire service sometimes, but that's why I like having different hats, <laughs> podcast thing, yeah, yeah. and have the coaching yeah. thing. And I come back off after days off, and I I feel like I've been away for weeks. Do you know what I mean? I'm reinvigorated because yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh, crikey, I wonder what this life's like. I can't watch it at the minute. Crikey, I wonder what the station's like. Yeah. I wonder what's happened. I wonder what jobs they've had. Because then when I leave there, and you know, people ask, you know, what oh, what have you done on your days off? And some people just say, oh, you know, sat around the garden, weather was rubbish, Mrs. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. just kept moaning at me or whatever. And I almost feel guilty yeah. because I'm going to sit down on, I'm going to get back and I'll be like... Uh, well, I mean, I had an awesome chat with this guy, Ross. He was super interested. I learned this stuff about vets. And then, you know, I went I went and trained a few times. I went to the, um, you know, I went into the woods with my daughter. We made a rope swing yesterday yeah. and stuff like that. But you feel guilty sometimes for saying it because, you know, misery loves company. <laughs> and some people are like, yeah. oh, well, it's all right for you. I'm like, dude, none of this stuff I did was expensive. You know, it was just like... Just and you made life. it happen. Yeah, I made it, it happen. happen to nobody you. nobody you turned up and gave me happiness. You know, that this is the thing. I yeah, think our yeah. mind is so elusive that it encourages us to seek for something that we already have within us. Do you know what I mean? There's a strange aspect there that, you know, you when people think, oh, I need to go on holiday, like you said, you know, I'm going to go on holiday once a year to get happy. You know, you, you go on holiday and there you are, everywhere you go you take yourself with you. So if you can't find you can't find what you're looking for exactly where you are right now, it doesn't lie on the other side of the channel. It doesn't lie in a plane for ticket. Sure, it doesn't lie in a person. Do you know what I mean? I was no, saying to my wife. I was, I was actually going to say that. Yeah, I was, was going to bring that point up. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm certainly not in a position to be dishing out, well, uh, you know, on, I guess past history. Um, my relationship with wife perhaps shouldn't be, be taken as gospel here, but yeah, it's true. I mean, if you cannot find the happiness and the security within the the walls of your own body, within your own skin, what a disaster to try and expect it on someone else, of someone else. What a pressure to put on them. You know, How horrible and unfair. Them, but, That's so unfair. On yeah, you. exactly. Like, you can't expect, you know, I, I don't know. I, I get a bit annoyed even when people say, and everybody says it, and then nobody thinks about it, but I, I just, me being a bit of a, and overthinking things and being being smarmy but when people say my other half i always think hang on a second you need to be two holes not not like two halves here because Mate, you totally need to be a complete you. person you cannot rely on that individual put that pressure on them um, i'm agreeing so on, yeah, i'm agreeing with you as a happily married person i always say that my wife and my kids and stuff like that they enrich my life they don't define my life oh, for sure you know i hope no, my no, wife no. live i hope my wife outlives me and i hope she's extremely happy yeah, and- but if she dies tomorrow i will of course mourn her but um after that my, my life has got to go on you know she, she enriches my life if um, she suddenly decides she doesn't like me anymore or there's a nicer guy out there who enriches her better than me then you know what? That's that's for her to go on and pursue the best part of her life. I should want to add value to her life. She doesn't have an obligation yeah, to me. Is- She's, she doesn't owe me anything financially, physically, emotionally. Everything I've done, everything <clears throat> I've bought for us, it's been out of choice. You know, she's not she's not forced me to do yeah, it. This wasn't a and it wasn't an arranged marriage. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's not a not a not a business transaction, and that's the thing. Like, she she wants you, doesn't need you, really. That's absolutely the way it should always, always be. And we should remember to want each other because I think, you know, as soon as you uh, stop, if you, if, you, if you treat somebody like you did at the beginning, then there's, there's never going to be an end. You know, when you first meet somebody, God, everything, yeah, yeah. everything they do, you know, the way they breathe, the way they look, yeah, the way everything, good. you're just infatuated with it. And mm. and I get that things can become a little bit familiar, but they should they should always excite you in some way or another. You know, their gregarious humor, the way they look, the way they, they spend time with you. And, and it's knowing you can't get everything from one person as well. I think that's a big thing, you know, because like you said, yeah, yeah. when you get with somebody or whatever, 
it's quite unfair. Some people go with this unspoken contract of, um, you're going to be my best friend. You're going to be a sex god. Mm. You're going to be an athlete. Yeah, you're going to be the lot. perfect, yeah. perfect parent. You're going to be my soulmate. You're going to be my therapist. You're going to be my chef. And I want you to be my provider. Uh, and I want you to be home by five uh, o'clock. Man, like That's you. not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, You've got on. to be able to do a lot of that yourself. And also the bits, you can assemble yeah. this like a jigsaw. You can assemble it from parts of your life. I get <laughs> I get humour from my daughter and I might get, a, you know, I'm, I'm having a lovely enriching conversation with Ross today. It's on it's on me to go out and find yeah, yeah. these things within myself and within my life. I mean, uh, essentially, and it's not just with people. We've said it already with, uh, you know, with the tangible actual assets, the houses, cars, areas you live in, holidays, possessions, what have you. If you're not complete, and I'm not saying I'm complete and I'm there at the end of my journey, I'm definitely no, God, absolutely no. not. I'm only just starting to discover these things, but uh, I, I like to share my thoughts and because if people shared their thoughts with me and got me thinking this way. I'm yeah. glad they did. I'm grateful for people. So I'm uh, trying to do that to, to, to other people. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you've got to try and achieve something. I don't think we're ever going to anyone be fully complete, but just be at least secure and stable within yourself you know, in some aspects, really, before you start trying to rely on something else, because you mm. rely on something else, it will fail at some point. It will do. It will and that's not saying we point. don't have a belief in people, but it, it will fail, not because they're a bad person. It will fail. They just might die. It's not, they it's might not fail on you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it just, it'd be, you know, personal development and stuff like that. But again, the competitive thing, the strength thing, strength, you know, comes in various forms, as we all know. Mm. You need to try and attain some of it or some it doesn't even have to be an external strength relative to, to the rest of the population. No. Just a strength within yourself to go about your daily business, mm. try to be happy, uh, and, and, and that kind of thing where, where you, you, you don't really need the rest of the, of the world. Like, I, I don't need any of my friends. No. I could genuinely live on the desert island the rest of my days and, and probably be fine. But I like my friends. Mm. I like them, but I don't need them to come running with me. I don't need them to 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 sit and have a beer with me. I, I can do that on my own because I'm actually pretty happy with it. I love spending time around people of a of a growth mindset or people that are trying to better themselves. There tends to be people that are really, yeah. going after <clears throat> goals, that are going after things that are driving themselves. Because people that just want to go and do 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 something arbitrary. I'm not saying that you know, I'm better or worse than anybody, but. If they're doing something they're not enjoying and they're perpetually doing it, then I, I don't want to keep doing it. I don't want to keep engaging with it. And even if that person's a family member, you know, people have this yeah. with their siblings or their parents sometimes where if, if you know, it's not adding value to your life or their life anymore, then, you know, yes, look after them if they need you and, you know, send them a Christmas card or whatever. But you, you don't have an obligation to anybody in this world, I don't think. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, but, you know, possibly, I don't find it morbid, but some people might, you know, a bit thing. But at the end of the day, you, you, just you within your own skin, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, you were born into the world with your mother next to you, but um, in many ways, you, you're, you're alone. You, your own human. It's your you responsibility are. anyway. Doesn't matter who lies next to you when own. you're getting bed at night. You are alone. <laughs> And that's not something yeah, you should fear or you should like, oh my God, no, I'm alone. No, no you, you are alone. No, you need to be able to, to find a way to be happy and independent by yourself. And only then can yeah, you remember. That's it. Otherwise, every exchange you're going into, you're trying to gain something. I'm taking. I'm, I'm taking. Yeah, I'm, taking. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm coming with a deficit. Sure. Ross, give me this. You need sure. to make me happy. You need to make me wealthy. Yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's not fair. Yeah, and you know, I've, ex I've, I've experienced that before and it, it's very, very quickly, very, very draining and it does not end well. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. For, for anybody. It's, it's, yeah, explosion, yeah. So I wanted to take us all the way back. I've gone such a lovely, lovely, lovely little segue there. <laughs> I want to take <laughs> us back to uh, to the favourites. Now, what's your favourite animal to treat, first and foremost? Mm, you know what? I'll probably just say a cat. Um, just no! Because, oh, yeah, because, man. Well, I'm hoping you were going to be a dog clinically. guy. <laughs> no, well, it, it, they, generally they're easier or slightly better to treat, slightly less stressful. But the only reason I like cats is just because they make things a bit trickier. They don't read the textbook. They don't obey the rules of physiology sometimes. <laughs> okay. And they don't take your shit. No. They're they like, they're like moody if, teenagers, they are. Yeah, if that thing doesn't like you, you are not getting the catheter in it. <laughs> the dog, you can wrestle him and give him a treat and put a muzzle on him and back him into a corner if you must and get someone to hold his head. Yeah. You'll get it. Almost most of the time. If that cat doesn't want to, I mean, he weighs four or five kilos. Yeah. 
and they've almost like, like I mean, obviously they've got a skeleton, but it's almost like they've got no spine. They can just spin around and they, uh, yeah, they just slip, know slip through their own fur and then all of a sudden they've bitten you and you're like, I thought I had the head in yep. my hand. No, it's just bitten you. Yep. <laughs> oh, how? Yeah, next thing you've got like three lacerations for your forearm and you're like, okay, I'm bleeding quite badly right now and there's this four kilo cat that's sat there going, right, do that again. <laughs> um, do that again I'll take you so yeah they, they, they're a bit more fun and also I shouldn't say this but I find it really funny when a cat bites someone else yeah I find it really 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 funny I don't know I mean a dog is different like it can do some damage but I just can't help absolutely just creasing up and it's really bad I know I'm a terrible colleague but <laughs> when a cat bites and scratches someone I just it's so funny. I love it. I really love it. <laughs> it is because it's like you can't escape it. It seems to be on you. You can't escape it. It's like, oh my God. So quick, and it's like, how's this little thing? Just something to treat them. So, yeah, I, I don't know. They're, they're quite fun to treat. It's equally frustrating, but fun. <laughs> now, you've done, uh, we spoke earlier about, you know, crikey gunshot wounds to animals and, and, and all this sort of mm. stuff. What have been, what stand out in your mind as some of the, and maybe something, you know, quite, quite benign. What have been some of the more challenging cases you've had to deal with? I would say, I'm trying to think of a couple of examples, but in most cases, it, it hinges around the circumstances surrounding the case, usually more so than just purely the clinical job in front of you. So, uh, well, one example that was, is, that it's a funny, good story in hindsight, but it was, it was pretty fucking stressful at the time. <laughs> it was a dog I mentioned earlier, and I did do ages ago a very short video on it. I wish I'd filmed the whole thing, but I couldn't because I was on my own, which is what made it stressful. But I had to take this pretty aggressive, huge, big uh, Iraqi shepherd dog who <clears throat> was known for not being that friendly. He had a really, really bad uh, jaw infection, and he just really needed help. Uh, we had to transport him across town to... A guy who had a local practice, if we could call it that, um, because he <laughs> apparently had a dental drill. And I said, like, this is, it was one of his canine teeth. And that thing is not coming out unless you've got a drill. Uh, unless you want me to break the jaw, which, you know. Not yeah. So I had to sit in the back of the pickup truck with this dog, like just hoping that he did not chew my face off at any minute, drive across town, um, a little bit dangerous anyway, <clears throat> get there, sedate and anesthetize them all on my own. And normally, like here in the UK, I've got nurses that do this for you, yeah. that for you. I was going to say, because even, even that first about... bit there, somebody would say, well, why don't you just put it to sleep? What, how long for? How much does it weigh? Do you know what I mean? All of yeah. these factors, people are like, well, can't you just put it to sleep? I might kill it. These drugs the sedate is... you. Unless you have too much, then you die. Yeah, and if any vet or, or, or human medic is listening to this, they're going to be like, what is this cowboy doing? But <laughs> there's no gas anesthesia there. So the way that we had to do a lot of these animals was just a whole load of ketamine and a load of a drug called metatomidine, which um, I don't know if humans use it, but it's pretty freaking potent. It's reversible. It's another <laughs> drug, but it is very potent. It, 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 it's a very, very um, strong sedative. It knocks the heart rate down, respiratory rate down. Mm, it's, it's, it's good stuff, but you've got to be very careful. And, and ketamine. So anyway, you mix this stuff in a drip bag. And the way you do the anesthetic is just by eyeballing roughly, like there's actual super calculations about how many drops per second you should be dripping this thing in. I just, we just do it by eye because all these dogs, we don't even know how much they weigh. Jeez. So I'm just, I'm doing the surgery, monitoring the dog and just, uh, knocking a wheel to like, ah, oh, shit, I need more ketamine and just blast it in. Oh, whoa, he's gone too deep. He's nearly dead. Okay, slow down, slow down. This is all just myself talking to myself wow. while still trying to do the surgery on his mouth. I don't have the equipment that was told to me was going to be there. There's not even a table. The dog is so long, he's falling off the table. His head's like, oh, the, I don't have Jesus. anywhere to put my equipment or tools and like in like 30 odd, 35, 40 degrees Celsius, um, not much light. It, yeah, just a bit of a nightmare really. But that particular case all went really, really well. And yeah. the dog was super friendly afterwards. I think he was just in so much pain before that. He was just very aggressive. But yeah, so that's just an example that it's usually the, the circumstances surrounding the case. If that was in the UK, it would have been a little bit challenging, but you know, yeah, it's fine. You, you do it in, in an hour, no worries. Yeah, but imagine um, how much but, it would cost but, uh, in the UK. Yeah, exactly. But just out there with like zero equipment. 
Yeah. Uh, and people hear that yeah. and you, you're a hero. Do you know what I mean? But if you did that to a human being in the UK with the best of intentions, with the best of intentions, yeah. Ross, and they died, oh my God, yeah. you'd be in prison. Yeah. Yeah. But even, I, I know probably most vets, I don't, you know, there's probably not many, many veterinarians listening to this, but if they are, they'd be thinking this guy is an idiot and irresponsible and shouldn't do that and I would never do that. Yeah, you wouldn't and neither would I. Neither would I if I had any other option. It was either like we do this thing and I'll back myself. I wouldn't do it if I thought I was going to fail. Yeah. I knew it would be an epic, but I believed I would probably succeed, probably. Yeah. Um, so it's either that or leave the dog to suffer. And as a vet, no, I'm not going to do that. So it's lesser yeah. to evil. But yeah, there are circumstances where you have to just get on and try it. Yeah. Um, if if the only other option is ongoing suffering, and you know, I I I love trying new things, but I will always offer an alternative if it's available. I wanted to ask you because we've been speaking about cats, dogs, horses, all sorts of animals mm. like that. And certainly from a selfish perspective for me, I know you'll have um, different levels of, of interaction and experience with, with different animals. But a useful, I always try and think of a useful takeaway from a lot of, and I think there's been so many sure. already. But I wanted to ask you, you know, when you're approaching hostile dogs, so in the fire service, we mm. will go into properties sometimes with a deceased relative or something like that. And the RSPCA, yeah. for anybody that's not aware, they're running out of money rapidly and they don't have a 24-hour response uh, in, the, in the UK anymore. And sometimes we're getting different members who are trained up in snaring animals. And I've got obviously a passion for animals. I've got horses and dogs and stuff like that. So I'm always the first one to kind of get involved. But I don't sure. think I've ever had any formal training about how we should be approaching animals, what are the telltale signs. I mean, I, I don't know how much from your own experiences mm. you've either been trained or you'd be able to glean some light on these. But, I mean, let's start with dogs because you've been in some pretty hostile environments. Yeah. What are some of the telltale signs or or how, how do you start approaching a dog that you have to go near or you have to get around or you have to interact with and you're not sure you don't know it? I think the first thing to do if you have the luxury of time and physical space is to use that. So do not rush. Um, by that, I mean take your time to try and make some sort of assessment that we'll speak about in a second. Yeah. Uh, yes, 90% of the time you might be able to just walk up and pick it up and put a slip lead around its neck. But if that one time, the 10% of the time that you can't or shouldn't have done that, you're going to get bitten in the face, the hand, the finger, whatever. And mm. you know, it could have consequences. It may not. It may just put you off dogs or whatever. Um, but it shouldn't shouldn't ideally happen, right? So if you have physical space, give them some physical space. Mm -hmm. Give them time. Um, it, it, this is a general thing for most animals, but you know, let's remember now a dog essentially is a carnivore. It could be. Uh, it, 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 it's it's probably far more likely to attack than run away than than a cow. Yeah, they can be very dangerous too, as I'm sure you know. But the dog is more likely. So we want to not threaten the dog. We have to get into the dog's mind and try to think what it may be thinking. There's this guy who's come in with a big uniform, maybe he's got a helmet on, maybe he's got other equipment, I don't know. Yeah. A whole bunch of strange people, there's noise here. Um, and I'm in a corner. Yeah. This, this, this man or woman is coming closer. Hang on a second. All right, this dog might, might, be, might be threatened. Physically, what are the things you might be looking for? Um, tail between the legs, almost always. Tuck between the legs. So not necessarily means it's aggressive, but it means it's scared and it's worried, yeah. which often translates into aggression in the dog very, very quickly. Yeah. So tail between the legs, ears back and down, quite similar to a horse. You know, you see them with the ears back and you think, oh, hang on mm. a minute. Mm. Um, and lip, lip smacking is another, another telltale one. So it always kind of looks like the dog's got a dry mouth. It's going, yeah. eyes darting all over the place. It's kind of lowered its head down a little bit. Back might be a little bit flatter. Um, and it may also put itself in a corner. Those are all signs that this dog is not happy and there's, there's a fair chance you're gonna, gonna get bitten. Um, not necessarily easy to, to then deal with that, but you know, the first thing is to know that there is a threat there, not yeah. just, not just go, go barging in. And you, you can't always tell by breed. There, there's such a variation of kind of upbringings, if you like, and environments of dogs nowadays that um, you know, I, I've seen, I, I, there are a few breeds where you think, oh, you're more likely to bite me than, than you are. But, um, you have know, you found that to be the case? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. What, what are some yeah, of the, there's, there's the, a few, the breeds that you tend to watch out for? Is there, I mean, cause there's um, some, band, gonna, some band breeds in the UK, isn't there? 
There are, um, but you know what I'm about to say will no doubt irritate, upset, and piss some people off. But <laughs> Good. It's my reality and my truth and my experience, and I have no bias, no reason for for this saying this, other than what I have seen and my colleagues have seen. Um, but generally, your German shepherds more likely, far more likely, to give you a bite than most other dogs. Really? Generalization, yes. I know you get German Shepherds, people who own them absolutely love them. Mm. Each dog is wonderful, like each person in their own right, but that's my experience. I've been bitten a lot of times. I've had them try and bite me a lot of times and my colleagues and stuff. Um, border Collies is uh, probably 90% of them I've been in a few. Yeah. Border if Collies you're a are. Stranger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're very, yeah, very. You're uh, a stranger. They're very highly tuned animals, aren't they? I think that's why they're great they on are, farms. And they are but if they don't have that level far. of activity. They uh they can get a little bit crazy. Yeah, I they can nip you. And the trouble is, I'm generally quicker than most dogs. I mean, I like by the skin of my teeth, no pun intended. Oh, I'll get <laughs> what boom, I'm just moved out of the way. Like his nose grazed my arm. Collies are too quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, those guys. Were. And then there's a couple of others like Sharpays, um, Japanese Akitas, Huskies. Yeah, and then, you know these dogs that have been have this great into them through through pretty intensive breeding over many 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 years. You know, that German Shepherd, it's, uh, in, in many, many cases, what was it bred for? It's a protection dog. It's an attack dog. It's a military working dog. Yeah. The thing is, it, it, there's a fair chance it's inherited those genes and that phenotype and it's expressing those that it's more likely to bite you because that's its job a lot of the time. Mm. Um, you know, just so, so it goes on. Uh, but yeah, those are some of the, some of the very basic with dog. Dog behavior is actually far more complex than I think any of us know or appreciate. Mm. <clears throat> um, care to admit, but yeah, those are just some of the basics to, 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 to bear in mind when you're physically looking at a dog. Take a sec to give it physical space mm. and take a sec to just watch its body language and its demeanor. Uh, much, much horses you are, if uh, you had a person there. Horses, I think, are one that particularly scare people. Just because of the yeah, sheer and, power and me too. of the animal. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I like them, though. Yeah, no, straight up, me too, man. I like them because <laughs> they scare me, if you know what I mean. I like, I like going out to the horses in the mornings and, like, you know, a few of them will be whipping around the fields and just messing about and whatever. But <laughs> there's something about being around an animal that is just that powerful that it, uh, it really puts you in your place. I think it gives me a lot of, um, a lot of self-awareness. When you're standing next to this yeah. beast and it's bloody huge, and uh, and it really really works on your ability to build rapport, build a relationship because you need to. You know, if you're going to get into the stable with it, yeah, you can get out sure. maybe quite quickly, but ultimately it can turn around quite quickly and and uh, switch your lights off indefinitely. Oh yeah, if, absolutely. if it wants to, absolutely. Yeah, and again, it's, it's, uh, I think space with horses is a huge, huge thing. Of course, the classic thing of trying not to go behind them. Um, I mean, actually, I used to think, oh, all horses will kick you if you go behind them. It's not the case. But if you do get a back kick from a horse, you're done. You're out of there. And you may die. And, mm. and people have been killed plenty by getting kicked from the back from a horse. So, you know, it might be unlikely, but if it does happen, you're done. So that's, that's just not worth the risk. Um, but yeah, that, that's the main thing with, with cows and horses is give them space and try not to get between them and anything hard. You know, you don't want to be between the wall or that fence. Yeah. Yeah. If that thing turns around for any reason, and mostly it will be fear, or one is to get out of there, yeah. but it turns and its ass or its head it knocks you against the wall, you're going to have very serious injury. Yeah. You know, serious, serious crush and, and blunt trauma injury there. Even um, if you're near you know, the, the rear end of a horse, and this was told to me hmm. on one of our handling courses, I thought it was really important. And they said it to me about getting punched as well, because there's, a, you know, when, when I used to work on the doors, I mean, you know, 10 years ago at least, where's the danger zone? I'm like, well, it's, you know, it's where you're going to get yeah, punched. Up. If you're really close to somebody, they can't punch you. It's not too bad. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. They, they said, you know, with the horses, they were like, you know, give them distance. But then when you're going to commit, don't run up on the horse. But, you know, when you're close enough, then be, be with the horse. Place your hand on it. Let it feel that you're there. Because if you're always standing at sort of arm's width away, just like tapping it, it doesn't know what you're doing. It's a little bit like yeah, it gets yeah, yeah. very wary of you because it can feel how scared you are. No, that's it. And it's like, what are you doing? Are you about to do something or are you here with me? And also, I see this when you see um, uh, farriers shoeing horses. They'll get very close to the animal, even with a rear leg. Because a bit like a punch, if you stood right close to me, and I tried to punch you, because the inertia is coming straight from you, you don't get the, 
you don't get that crack right at the end. What actually yeah, yeah, yeah. happens is the horse just throws you. It just it that's just exactly. it just flings you off, and you don't get that snap at the end of it because that's what people yeah. you know they're standing three feet away, and then it kicks and it hits you right on the exactly. crack. It hits you right at the edge of it. Yeah. So be really close to it, and then if it gets really upset, then step away very fast. But don't be in that middle yeah. zone. Either be with it or be far away from it. Yeah, because you, if you're at the end of the extension of that limb, that, that's essentially where the power is, is yeah. culminating. Yeah, so, yeah, are you lifting up a horse's hoof to examine the back leg as a very example? Worst case, it kicks up. It will just throw you and, you know, might chuck you into the wall, but you're not going to get that badly hurt. But you're not going to receive that hoof no. to the head. Yeah. Um, and also, it's kind of like when you're with the horse, uh, once you have got within that personal space, you need to, Kind of commit your intentions to it by yeah. some tactile contact. Yeah. Um, generally, the shoulder area and lower neck is the best place to, if you can, a approach the horse um, yeah. from, and also to stand because, mm. especially if you do have the luxury of a lead rope, um, you control the head, you control the animal. Yes. In, in most most of these large animals, yeah. um, but also just the one on that to so just be aware for people. Be aware who else is around because you turn the head of the horse one way, the thumb is going the other way, yeah. often quite quickly. Um, mm. So, you know, make sure your muck is not stuck in the far corner of the stable, picking up the gear or <laughs> yeah. bent down or something like that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, so, is there any animals other than uh, scary collies and for German shepherds? Is there any animals you're particularly scared of if something comes into the surgery or anywhere you've been abroad where you're like, no, I'm not, I'm not messing about with that? No, not really. Um, I mean, any wild animal is, you know, necessary precautions, but, but I, I wouldn't say so, really. Um, I mean, I'm not a fan of spiders. No one's ever brought me one. Um, <laughs> and I'd probably, I'd probably very quickly refer them to an exotic specialist, and I'd be damn sure to find one. <laughs> <laughs> you get really resourceful when you need to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, luckily I've never been put in that situation yet. Um, no, I mean, I did a bit of work... Um, as a final year student in America with seals, and those those guys are actually surprisingly aggressive and dangerous. Oh wow, um, got to be pretty cool. and strong. It is because it's like very a, strong. People forget how heavy they are as well. I swam with seals once, and they're yeah. massive. I yeah. swear to God, the one I was swimming was like 140 yeah. kilos. He was like, "Yeah, he's not fully grown oh, yet." Probably, uh, and I was like, "What?" He's 140 kilos and he's not fully grown. And they were like, let him swing up to you and then he'll come and put his chest against your chest. And I'm like 19 stone. And it just knocked me flying. <laughs> it's like a it's like a dog with its face and its teeth and everything like that. But it's so big yeah, and yeah. strong. And you're in a completely foreign environment yeah. with it. It's just a big ball of muscle. It is, yeah. And and they can can be pretty aggressive, you know, if they're completely wild or perhaps have just been in care for a week or two re, to re, uh, rehabilitate it, yeah. No, other than that, there's nothing really that struck, uh, struck fear into me, really. Thinking back to your military career, sorry, and now going into to mm. your veterinary work, what have been no, some, of the, some of the proudest moments that you had in your time in the military? Um, I, I suppose the obvious one is the passing out parade the day you, you know, get your duties um, and go up to a commando unit. Is, is, but, I mean, that's the obvious one. Probably, for me, probably some of the more quieter moments, actually. Um, mm on operational tours, they weren't in, by no means defining moments, but perhaps, and, and it, it, this might just be personal to me, but I very often felt a, a great sense of pride leaving the battlefield alive, so to speak. You know, and, and I mean, nobody was marching off it, but, you know, <laughs> driving, walking, flying, what have you, making your way back, knowing that you genuinely, you know, and uh, it, the cause and the outcomes are irrelevant to this particular conversation, but, Knowing that you fought your best as a human, yeah, you know, maybe okay, maybe we disagree about the, the, the nobility of it or what have you. That's just another discussion, right? But knowing that you've done your best, you've actually absolutely worked your nuts off. You've covered in sweat and dirt. Um, you're alive. Hopefully, most of your people are alive. Most of the time, everyone was alive. <clears throat> um, I actually always felt a little quiet sense of pride there. Yeah. Again, nothing that I would absolutely display, but I always felt pretty pretty good about that. Mm. release as well um because the nature of war is there's going to be a winner and a loser and uh yeah, sometimes yeah. the loser comes at the For cost sure. of somebody's life and it's uh it's not necessarily too much of an yeah. aspect of luck because obviously risk mitigation and we try and give people the correct <laughs> tools and training to be able to protect themselves and, and defeat the enemy but it, by that very statement the, the enemy is going to go home or somebody's not going to go home yeah 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 and uh, you know that's reality and it's not 
so this clarified that pride is not, you know, we've downed X number of enemy fighters. Yeah. Yes, yes, there is. Yes, there is a, a, a joy about that. And, that, you know, full, full authenticity, full disclosure. There is an immediate relief and happiness to know that you have done that because yeah. that is less X number of people who are going to kill you. Yeah. For that pure reason. It's the reality um, of it. So, yeah, it, it is. It is. And I mean, why are you there? What's going on? Right. There's, there's pieces of lead flying this way. There's pieces of my lead flying that way. Mm. We are not here playing chess. We're not negotiating. Yeah. We Don't are get too to romantic about it. This person thinking. is trying to kill you. Yeah, they are. And the only way that I'm going to survive is to either run away, which, you know, tactically a lot of the time we do retreat. That's cool. But to either do that or kill the guy. And, and you know, that, that's to be horribly blunt about it. But that, that's not the, the pride anyway. I, I was never proud to say, look, you know, so many people are, are lying dead or what have you. Um, it was more to know that I've fought and we fought well mm. and our communication was good and yeah. we didn't cock up in any way. The weapons all worked well. Our prep was good. The plan went well. Mm. You know, that, that kind of thing. Just to know that things came together and, and you know, we're walking away from it. Now, I mean, and op operating in zones like that and, and seeing the sort of stuff and have to engage in conflict like that, but then also seeing the the amount of cruelty that you'd seen done to animals that perhaps a lot of people, myself included, haven't seen mm -hmm. um, cruelty on that level of intensity and, and ha won't have been in those sort of hostile situations. Is there anything that you've learned about yourself that surprised you that might be a complete comparison had you have only ever lived in a civilian life? Yeah, I... Um it's no longer a surprise to me, but I'm always quite pleased at my ability to, in the moment, just switch off the emotion and just look at something, see it, and not feel it necessarily. Uh, and I, I think that is a positive thing. You know, there may be a psychologist out there going, mm, actually, that's going to spell disaster in a few years or what have you. No, uh, you know generally, what, I'm okay in that respect. That can um, spell disaster, I think, in certain aspects, but... I think anybody that has achieved a certain amount of success, even if that's just personal success in their own physical disciplines, like they're really fit or they're really healthy or they're a consumer professional at the job they do, they they will have yeah. that very similar switch. And the, there's a great book, um, and they talk about something called the hair test. Have you ever heard of it? No, no, no. No, Google it later. The hair test is something they would use to assess somebody's psychopathic or sociopathic tendencies. And you'd be astonished, perhaps, although you perhaps wouldn't be astonished, to see how many people who operate as a professional in their in their field, whether they're a top CEO or whether they are mm -hmm. um, a head teacher or you know they're top in the military or somebody that does a very you know important job like a surgeon or people in the emergency services, yeah. maybe they can have a lot of correlation with what can be identified as psychopathic tendencies because of their ability to yeah. disconnect from the emotional yeah, side of point. it. And that in, in the wrong environment, that can be, you know, when you reference the, if you know, if a psychiatrist is listening, yes, in the, in the wrong environment, that can be very destructive. But if you place yourself in an environment where these, these, these tools are really, really useful, then they're really, really powerful, but you know, it, it does have those tendencies and, and it can worry people it, when they see you acting in that way. They're like, God, what's wrong with Ross? Why is he so cold? You know, and, and I've had this mm, at times. Yeah, and yeah. It is a secret superpower, but if you're not in the right environment with it, it can, it can really switch people off. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I watched a really interesting documentary about that. Um, and uh, I think it was, they, they kind of like rank your common professionals amongst who's the most likely to be psychopathic or <laughs> what, um, what proportion were, were, were classified as psychopaths. And I think it was like um, investment bankers and solicitors and then surgeons. Yeah. My mother last week had some pretty freaking, what to me, even as a vet who loves blood and guts, well, geez, a pretty moving surgery uh, on her brain. I mean, they had to open her skull up and the, the surgeon was like, well, a two hour gap has opened up, so I'm just going to squeeze you into that. Come yeah. to the hospital tomorrow. You know what? I, I would be preparing for days for that. I'd be like, oh my God, this is you. But yeah, the fact that that, that man uh, in, in that case can just very, very calmly yeah. complete that procedure with all his wits about him successfully That's it. In, a, in a two hour gap that had suddenly been thrust upon him. He didn't even know he was going to do it. It's just and, tools uh, for the job, you know, isn't it? Resounding like... success is fantastic. So yeah, he used that as a tool. If I may be frank, that is how I see animals now. Um, mm. in, in a way, being a vet has kind of killed my uh, my personal life or passion for animals because when I see them, <clears throat> I see the signs, I see the yeah. problems, all the fixes, what have you. Mm. But uh, I, 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 
yes, I see somebody's pattern. Yes, I know <clears throat> that it means the world to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know all these uh, emotional connections and importances, but I just see the signs. Yeah. And I'm doing the maths in my head, and I'm doing these things, and the working out, and the the diagnostic processes all in my mind, and using the kit and equipment. And essentially, it's it's yeah, it's it's a machine in front of me, and I've got to fix that thing. Um, and I find that helps me. I guess in most cases, probably is really struggle to switch off. I, mean, I I can't switch it off. I don't I don't think about animals in my little bit of spare time, and you know I, I try to detach from work. But yeah, when somebody does present me with something, whether it's formally or informally. Yeah. My mind is automatically thinking like, right, okay, you've got some problems there. And I don't ever say it. I never say it because yeah. it's never well received. That's, no, ever, that's not what ever. they're there for. And you're like, you just have to let them linger. So on that note, I wanted to ask you just about some, some personal habits. I mean, obviously you said you did some, sure. some training this morning. You've spoken yeah. about this ability to, to not be cold, but to be able to detach emotionally. What are some of the habits sure. over the past sort of one, three, five years that you've developed, or even perhaps something you developed during, during this COVIDian craziness that you feel is really, really serving you well? Um, I mean, I've, I've started a, I wouldn't call it a journey because it's like ground to a halt, but I've, I've started an awareness and a very, I'll use the term practice loosely, some personal development, personal growth, um, that's an umbrella term. Um, they, they not officially have it because I haven't done them regularly enough, but yeah, there's, there's that side of things. How does that um, manifest itself? Is uh, that, do you read things? Do you attend something? Do you listen to something or? Yeah, um, so well, it started off with podcasts and the idea of the meditation and gratitude and this type of thing, and, and having just through 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 luck, I guess, meeting some people who've introduced me to the idea. But then it's it's, it's on me. I don't really um, consume any guided or directed stuff anymore. Um, mm. I have a few books, really amazing books that I've read and that that have helped in helping me. But but then yeah, it's your your kind of private quiet practice couple of minutes in the morning 10 minutes and maybe 10 minutes at night sort of thing without well, wanting to put but also, on the spot and potentially forgetting one of the books what was uh what is one of the books if you could uh, if you could remember it oh yeah cool um probably <laughs> i've tried to force this book on three people now <laughs> but it's a it's a book called the gratitude diaries the gratitude diaries by janice captain <clears throat> yeah i've read it uh, it's very poignantly but simply written very mm. easy read isn't it most um, books need to be that way, though. Some books are really long. And yeah, yeah, fully You agree. only take about two or three pages from the book. You'll take last 10%. The gratitude that I do now, I do it every morning, and I just have a little pad by my bed, and I do five yeah, things cool. that I'm grateful for. Two of them have to be... Uh, good, good, good. Two of, them, two of them have to involve other people, and then the other three can just be personal things. I, I'm, you know, oh, sometimes it might really be as simple healthy, as um, I'm grateful to be alive. I feel I'm grateful yeah. for being fit and healthy. I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for a job that I love that I'm given the opportunity to do. Yeah, I'm brilliant. grateful for living in an affluent world that I've got lots of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm not subjected to slavery on a daily basis because we can be brilliant. so guilty for just focusing on the negatives. And we are so, we're so yeah. goddamn lucky. My God, you know, to be alive in this uh, time, mate. mate, the opportunities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. I am like a kid in a sweet uh, shop. Unreal. I just feel yeah, like um, it's amazing. I'm glad you brought that up. I know we're going a little bit off piece again, but um, yeah, so I have, so it's, just, it's different from the, the Gratitude Diaries book. I have a gratitude journal, diary, whatever you want to call it. Now, um, full disclosure, I haven't written in it for about three or four months. Naughty. Um, and that's what I was alluding to. I need to get back to it. Uh, but yeah, I, I cannot, I can't verbally emphasize the benefit that that's brought to me yeah. uh, on a personal level. Absolutely fantastic. And it was off the back of, um, just having dinner with someone once who said, oh, I've got a gratitude diary and this is what to do with it and stuff. And then I read the gratitude diaries, um, started the diaries. Fantastic. Uh, what an amazing, genuinely life changing, but simple, quick, easy practice. And yeah. Cause it, it takes you focus to the right it, place. You know, if, if, where, where yeah, your focus sure, is, we, is where, where you draw all your energy from. And people get hooked up yeah, sometimes. Absolutely. Cause like you've said about having, having a diary and there's nothing right or wrong about the way you're doing it. But some people can overcomplicate stuff if they're not careful. For example, they'll go, I used to have a gratitude diary, but I don't know where I've put it. Or I went around my friend's house and I left it or I show, or I took it to work and I've left it in my locker or something like that. For me, mm -hmm. I've probably got several pads that on several pages will all have my gratitude lists and they'll be different every day. Yeah, you yeah. Know, some, some are some constants, yeah. but they'll change all the time. It's more the action of doing it 
You know what I mean? That, yeah, that actually yeah. going through the eye. It doesn't matter if you're in the right place. You haven't got to be sitting in the lotus position on a cliff top in order to <laughs> do it. You can be sitting in your car before you go into work. You know, you can be, you know, it doesn't matter what you're writing it in. There is something very physical about writing it because yeah, you're that's, not that's necessarily doing it on your phone. You've got to write it or, not, or you yeah, should yeah. write it because it, it makes it yeah, exist yeah. in the yeah. universe. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, what, I, what I've started doing now is interim is thinking the gratitude thoughts, but absolutely it's not the same as physically writing it down, which is why I need to get back to physically writing it down. Mm. <clears throat> and during that period when I was writing it down every day um, for you know many m- months, yeah, phenomenal benefit. So I've tried to, I've, I've got my own copy of the Gratitude Diaries book and I've actually bought and given three copies to, well, to three people. Good um, man. Because <laughs> I <laughs> I'm trying to force it on people. I, I don't yeah, think should. any of them have read it. You should. Um, but how I, selfish I, I just, of you. If you found something that benefited your life and you didn't share it with somebody, how selfish yeah, that would be exactly. of you. Yeah, exactly. And like, the book costs, I don't know, is it like 10 quid or something at the most? And I mean, just the paperback was cheap as chips. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. Like I was going to give my copy to somebody and I thought, actually, no, I'm just going to buy them one because I want my copy for myself. I still want to have a copy because I'm yeah. probably going to read it again. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think to be fair, the third person, I haven't long since given it to them, but, and I think they will read it, but the previous to one of which, whom is my sister, um, admitted she hadn't read it, but, um, I, I just, it frustrates me. That yet. I'm gonna whack him with the book. Like, she hasn't read it yet. Thing, man. I, she may, I, she may never read like, it. She may never read it, but you know, may never, it, it surprises you when some people come across these things and they'll revisit them. And even if they only look at it once, you don't know when the lightning bolt is going to strike for some people and it may never strike, but no, we're all, all, all you can do, when we talk about controlling the controllables. You can just give it with the intention of trying to add value to that person's life. And I do stuff like that on a regular basis. I, I give books to clients and I'll send them uh, audio books or podcasts or something like that. And I'm like, you know, 32 minutes in, just give me, just give me 60 seconds of your time. I want you to skip to that bit and just listen. Yeah, yeah. And then if you enjoy it, listen to the whole thing. Yeah, 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 fully. And it's, it's like, I, I don't want to preach to you, but I don't have to because just listen to this guy. And again, for two minutes or read the, read the first chapter of the book yeah. and then decide if you want to literally burn it, that's cool. But just have, have a little listen, hear me out on this one. You can get exhausted trying to change the world. Don't, don't try and change the world. Just start with yourself first and foremost. And then if people are willing, if people want to, then they'll engage and they'll they'll go on their own journey of, of personal development. But you can't send uh, you know you can't send ducks to Eagle School if they don't want to come. No, they're, no, <laughs> they're not going to go. Know, this kind of kind of ties into to, to to the voluntary work that I do. Is really so I said before it's not it, it, it's part selfish and it is. <clears throat> I do get benefit from it, mm. um, emotional benefit from it. Now and again, less than you may think, but but I do still get them and I'm happy to do it and I will continue to do it. But the other thing that I want to subtly happen as a consequence is I just call it planting little seeds of kindness. And it's essentially just trying to act by example uh, or lead by example. So if somebody sees this guy who doesn't need to be doing this stuff, Mm. doesn't need to. So I don't need to do it for uh, any gratification. I don't need to do it for finances. I don't need to do it profession. There's no reason I need to do it. No. In fact, it's of detriment to me. It costs me time, money, stress, danger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all, all those skills worth it for me. <clears throat> but what I would like, whether it happens or not, I don't know, but what I would like and what I try to subtly kind of uh, send out with the, with the social media messages is just a little seed of kindness that you too can do something yeah. to help somebody or help something. Tiny, tiny. Like, I'm not making a difference in the world at all by what I do. I'm you helping ever seen a couple the film of Pay people here and there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Pay yeah. it forward. That's, That's it. what it's yeah. all about, mate. You Pay know, a, a truly, yeah. a truly selfless act is doing something like that for somebody. You know, you, you do an act um, through your veterinary practice. They can't, you refuse payment. So there's no other way for them mm. to help to give it back to you. And that's not what you want. That makes it a truly selfless act, doing for something for somebody who can never return it. They can never repay it to you, but they can just bounce it on in the universe in a big or a small that's way. Exactly it. And, and a big or a small to you is how you quantify it. It may be massive to somebody else. You know, something mm. that takes you five or 10 minutes of time might change somebody else's life. You know, it's, it, it's very selfish of us, again, to think that, oh, me doing, you know, one thing for five minutes, like for this, you know, I guarantee, and I know this from from episodes that we've put out before, 
I get people message us and say, oh God, I listened to Dan Melia, you know, uh, FDMY fire department guy. Mm. And, you know, I got yeah, inspired yeah. and I've, I've gone and I've found out more about it. And there'll be somebody go, wow, you know, I thought all vets were dullest to be honest and uh, you know i listened to ross <laughs> and he was hilarious and you know he had a really interesting take on things and and that that might lead on to them pursuing a career in, in the exact thing you do now yeah yeah it's just trying to um and, and i'm you know no means saying i am leading by example because i mean if we delved into my personal life we'd go well there's a whole bunch of failures and you know <laughs> disaster and chaos and shit like oh, that man. but that's true i'm not living my life by example but i'm trying to do those deliberate acts uh, as example and, and some sort of contagious positive uh, people to pay forward. I wanted to uh, close with uh, just again, mm-hmm. in terms of paying it forward, the next generation of, of vet that comes you know, after you, I mean, you talk about the financial obligation, you talk about different ways to develop yourself professionally. So both in terms of the military and in terms of uh, veterinary, whichever one you want to go for first, what would your advice be um, to people that follow in your career footsteps, be that military or veterinary? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose I start with military just in a chronological order. Yeah, I, I, I think, well, the problem with the military is it's so vast, uh, vast an organization, but if you just look at somebody who maybe goes into a, a combat role of high intensity or, or high standards like, like, like I was fortunate to do, yeah, I would say let's try and make the most of your opportunities once you are in that organization. And you can... Be an individual to an extent. Yes, you are serving a greater good. You, you, you're just a cog in a big machine. But you are still capable of being an individual. And I think this is what I failed to do. You know, as I alluded to earlier, I failed to, to do lots of outside stuff. I just drank and trained. You know, it was just a, a fairly blinkered lifestyle. You can still be an individual. You can still um, bring your own flair to it. And that makes your career a bit more sustainable. <clears throat> um but also, you need to, again, this is what I failed to do and to realize at the time, manage yourself. You cannot rely on the hierarchy or the, or the, or the institution yeah. to manage your career or your path for you. You have to go and seek it out yourself and take it yourself. It may seem like you're in a very structured organization, and yes, you are, but you have to forge your path. Otherwise, it's going to do it for you. Much like life, I guess. You know, you've 100%. got to be proactive. And, That's why it's called personal development. Do that. You know, people say, yeah, you know, well, sure, uh, sure. I'm asking for these courses, but they don't seem to be going on. Well, you know, you can develop laterally. It's not just vertically. It's not just waiting for the next promotion, waiting for the next promotion. You know, your development is it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm developing now. You know, I develop all the time. I do the podcast. Podcast is yeah, nothing yeah. to do with sure. the uh, organization that I work for. It operates in a similar sector. Hmm. But, I mean, if I ever declared what I, who, the service that I work for, they'd probably sack me because I'm a bit fast and loose with my language on the podcast sometimes. Yeah. You know, but this is a massive part of my development. You know, the amount of insights I get from these conversations and you'll be the same. The stuff you do that you don't tangibly get yeah, paid for, for is what that's what personal development is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you've got to, you've got to take responsibility for it, really. And in a veterinary example, you know, I've, uh, I, again, we weren't going to do fun to wrap up, but you very quickly realize when you graduate, this is not the job you thought it was. The career is not the sort of the employers are not what you thought they were. You are not going to get looked after. The opportunities maybe aren't there. So you make your own. I've made my own. Yeah. I, I happen to get paid very, very well, way, way above average and way above probably what anyone at my experience level uh, time wise gets paid. Mm. But I've created that opportunity for myself. Um, yes, it wasn't part of a plan, but I've kind of sniffed it out and out and I, I've gone out and sought it and, and made it happen. Yeah, on a, on a veterinary front then, um, <clears throat> I think most of the advice I would give would, would relate to how your personality and your character interfaces with the clinical job. Uh, we're talking about a clinically practicing vet here. Yeah. And, you know, there are lots of vets, some work in abattoirs and uh, in offices and labs. We're, we're talking about a clinical practice here. This is where generally you'll find the greater demand on your, on your mental health. Um, and then that's, that's where I'd think of things is try and, try and seek out outside challenges, work out a way to deal with that time that's going to happen every single day when somebody is going to be really nasty to you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, someone is going to be really nasty to you most days. Yeah. Um, they're going to make you feel guilty. They may just throw all sorts of accusations at you formally, informally. And you need to figure a way of going home and forgetting about it. Um, I'm getting much better at it. I still struggle, and I get very frustrated. All my colleagues really, really struggle. 
Yeah. Um, I, I'm actually not too bad with it, but yeah, it's, it's, I think find a way with it's your mindfulness, your gratitude. Um, you've got to, you've got to seek some emotional happiness in the valley uh, yeah, from baby. your work, that, that kind of thing. Just, just try and build. It's not easy to do it huh, until you've experienced the badness, but uh, a, a mental resilience is very, very important. Absolutely. I think now, more so than ever, uh, mental resilience mm-hmm. is going to be the raft that uh, that carries people yeah. across because things are going to get more and more difficult, whether it be mentally, physically, financially, the water is going to keep rising. So the more you focus in on those things that are within your control, the more better equipped. And it brings us full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning to deal with the challenges that lay ahead, getting good at self-awareness, you know, gratitude um, and, and empowering yourself with habits and behaviors that, that are sustainable for you, then uh, then it's going to be very, very difficult for people as they move forward. So it's wonderful to hear that, mate. I've I've really enjoyed, really enjoyed our chat today. Really enjoyed our yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been an absolute genuine pleasure. Mate, it's uh, so it's really surreal. Cool. I always love it. I seem to accidentally find people that, you know, I just kind of get a feel for them. I'm like, I love that guy or that girl. I'm just going to have a great chat. And uh, it's been exactly that. Thank you for taking time out of your uh, very, very, very limited time on this uh, wonderful weekend. Let's both get out there and enjoy, no, some, uh, enjoy some sunshine. But look after yeah, yourself. Yeah, likewise, brother. Pete. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks for getting in touch, man. All right, take it easy. Take care, my man. Cheers, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, ladies and gents, boys and girls, how do you like them apples? Such an interesting character. Right, a quick note from me before you head off. Do not forget we are kicking off our July giveaway with our partner Hikes. Last month's winner, Brian Johnson, was one of the many people across our social media platforms, including YouTube, including emails, that got in it to win it, found himself the proud owner of a pair of Black Eagle Blue Citrus from Hikes themselves. So we're rolling into the next one. Jump over to the socials, jump onto the email list below. You will see a winner pair of Hikes post. Have a glance at it. There's no funny business. There's no charges. There's nothing crazy. You got to like it, follow it, and share one of the posts. It ain't rocket science, boys and girls. It had to be super simple because at the end of the day, I came up with it. If it was too complex, I was going to get it wrong. (laughs) So for a chance to be in it to win it, you know what to do. Head over there. And once again, a big thanks to the rest of our partners. A big thanks to you. I'm so excited about some of the guests I've got coming up. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry. And we'll see you again real soon right here on the Firefighters Podcast.